Oh, is that a <laughs> recording though so that's good um so today i'm with jimmy boston he does many things he's head coach at to currently yeah that's, that's um it. you program for jst train class our class program you have a couple of individual clients who jst compete as well yeah that's correct you organize a few events like some social. Yeah, yeah. I had to call that. Yeah, yeah. Holly and I do that. Have you missed any? Have I missed anything? Um, in terms of work related, no. No. Um, bit going on in life, which is always good. <laughs> Kids on the toes. Yeah. Um, so I want people to get to know you a little bit more. Um, you've been a part of the team for a couple of years now, um, but we've not have the opportunity to sit down and actually, you know, have a conversation and uh, talk a little bit about how you've got to, to where you are now. Um, so let's, let's go way back first, way, way back. back. Um, so I know your, your previous sport was rugby league, but do you want to give people a bit of a background, kind of where you're from, like where you were brought up, all that sort of stuff first? Yeah, well, I think, um, when you say rugby league, you assume that I'm, I'm a northerner, but I'm definitely and well and truly not. Um, and our little running north-south battles will continue for, mm -hmm. for many a year. Um, yeah, so kind of always played sport, always done that. And um, being an only child, um, it was kind of the, the thing that my, my parents got me into was like, go and play sport, go and learn how to uh, like move around with other people and, and, and have fun with that kind of always played football, never played rugby. Now I live in West London, which is quite a rugby union like uh, heartland. Um, yeah. But the school I went to was football in primary school. When I got to secondary school, um, there was a few teachers which were like really shaped how I am today um, in the sports department. And they were like, you're in year seven, you're a big kid, here's a rugby ball, start playing it. Um, it was rugby union from the start. There was no, there was no rugby league or anything like that. Um, and then as you progress through the years, you do the, the rugby union at the school, you do the, the county level. And I never really played rugby union for a club for very long, like for a long time. And then I started doing that. And uh, one of the things, if like, you know, there's lots of politics in, in sport, especially in kids sport with parents and stuff. And um, I wouldn't say I was in the wrong school or my parents were the wrong parents, but they just weren't the right ones. Um, <laughs> so sometimes getting in the team was never the, it was never based on talent or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, it was the, the coach's son who played in the same position as me. So it was always a- That's tough, isn't yeah. it, to pick that? Um, yeah. You said, you said about like your, your teachers kind of, you know, helping to shape, um, you know, who, you, who you've become today. What, what is it that they did or said um, that kind of, yeah, really yeah. set you on your- I think, um, well, I mean, there was, there was probably two, two to three teachers that were, Kind of the, the sports teachers that really pushed me and, and made me try and do things I couldn't do. Um, and one one guy called Jason Wing, or Mr. Wing, he was uh, an ex rugby league player. Yeah. Um, absolute unit. Um, <laughs> played played on the wing for they were called London Crusaders at the time, and like he 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 got me into fitness basically. They built a school gym, and he said, look, if you're going to do any kind of training. Um, just do power cleans, do bench press, um, and do weighted pull-ups. Wow. And I was like, if I think to now, if I could only do a few movements and not all of the CrossFit movements, 
I would say you're gonna be in pretty good shape if you can power clean a lot of weight. Yeah. Bench press, you're gonna look pretty good and your shoulders aren't gonna fall off. You can do a lot of pull ups. <laughs> so um, they were on the right track, but they were just, they were, they related to me the most. Like mm -hmm. the other teachers were good and I, it's not like I disliked school. Um, I didn't really enjoy going to school that much. I preferred the social element playing in all the sports teams. Yeah. But yeah, they, those guys really related to me. And when I was getting older and older and older, they, I think they possibly drew similarities or they saw bits of themselves in me. So they kind of pushed me along and yeah. and got me doing more sport, which was probably the best thing for them because I was a pain in the ass. <laughs> um, that's, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that where I think more people than we know actually, you know, maybe struggled in school in the sense that didn't really enjoy it, didn't really resonate with a lot of the stuff that was they were being, you know, taught. And it's it's one of them where rather than having a super set structure, it probably would be actually be nice to have a bit more flexibility and be like, actually I really enjoy sport more, can I do that a little bit more as a as a subject rather than mm. you know but I guess you've got to have a base level of, of knowledge and, and all that. So um coming to uh the kind of rugby union and the team and everything how how did that affect you at, at the time and what lessons from that did you kind of take forward or yeah how, how did that yeah. affect you really i remember obviously the with the the politics in the rugby union there was more in that in the later years of school um and i remember like one particular moment was so when I did start playing for a club, I just went with where my friends went and they were playing for London Irish. Okay. So went there and we were doing all the training, like kind of being a team when the, the games were all right. And then when there was a big game, so Richmond were our like local rivals mm -hmm. and they we had a game and I'd been in the team like the whole year. And me and a few of the other school friends, we went to the same school and like we were all in the team. Then all of a sudden we we're playing against the best team in the league and then we were all sat on the bench. And uh, it was down at Richmond, so big like community club. So there was lots of other games going on and they share a place with London Scottish. And I just sat on the bench the whole time. Our teachers come down to watch and I just sat there. My parents were, were there and they were like, what's going on here? And I was like, there was no chance of me going on. I don't know, they didn't put me on at all. Um, and at that point I'd started doing the rugby league thing and I'd started to like meet more people within lots of different sport, uh, different clubs. And then when our game finished, it was like an earlier kickoff. There was a lunchtime game for London Scottish, okay. but we were playing like under 16s or 15s or something like that. There was an under 18s game and my friend was playing in it and he was like, do you want a game? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I know you didn't play, do you want a game? You can come and play for the Colts or whatever it was. Yeah. I'm Scottish, I was like, yeah. Just where I was like, just double check my mum and dad because they're like, take the other minute, can I play? Um, and then, yeah, there's a guy called Rory, and he was like, yeah, come play. And uh, he was an exceptionally good rugby player. Still still see him every now and again as well. He does like the functional fitness world. Oh, okay. Um, and yeah, played, played quite well, got man of the match. Um, <laughs> played in the London Irish socks because that was the kit I had on. Um, and yeah, in the bar after. Um, I remember obviously the, the coaches for the, the team that didn't pick me were still in there watching mm. me play th three or four years above my yeah. age group, yeah. like, getting man of the match. And they were like, I remember the opposition said, oh, why didn't you play that kid to their coach? And he just didn't have an answer. And at that point, I stopped playing rugby union. Oh, okay. Done. Uh, rugby league was already kind of on the sniff yeah. um, through school. Mm -hmm. So they come in and they were trying to boost participation down south. Because obviously yeah. up here, there's no issues, everyone plays rugby league, right? Um, whereas down south there was um, the the school's cup, yeah. which then goes in and then you end up, if you do well in London, and our school got through, and then we went to Wales and we went to Merthyr, it was the first time I'd ever been to Wales, and yeah, that noise, that's the first time I'd experienced like the valleys, and like, <laughs> you're going in big, yeah, like these kids were massive, yeah. I was like, holy crap, this is going to be tough, and we, like, we got absolutely whooped. <laughs> and one of our players dislocated his shoulder. So okay. then we were like in a hospital, we were there forever, it was raining. Like you couldn't have made up how difficult it was, but I remember it like, oh, like if you're gonna do this, yeah. you, you've got to be able to do it. Yeah. Like the old like, can you do it on a rainy day in Stoke football? <laughs> you're like, 
if you can play rugby against some, some Welsh lads in Merthyr and it's really intimidating, you can probably play rugby anyway. I remember, so I briefly played rugby league as well, not, not to the, the level that, that you did, but the impression I got when I played the teams up north was that, like, this was the, the biggest thing of their week. It, and they were going into that game wanting to literally just smash you to bits every time. I don't know if it was like that in, Europe, uh, in Union or like the same intensity from like the people, but I was like, whoa, because I was just used to an individual sport and um, being like quite chill, you just kind of, you know, keep on top of your emotions and then I go, on, go into rugby league and everyone's super fired up, like really kind of like emotional and yeah. Yeah, I think it, the, the rugby league was much more physical at, at an earlier age or from the start. Um, and like the emotion was much more there and I think that's probably what lured me into it. Like it was something that was quite real, like rugby union was, it was obviously still a very physical sport and and you did all the things near enough in, that you do in rugby league, but just I think the confrontations, I don't know if it was obviously in London, rugby league was very small, like I said, and every sport, every game you played was against Northern, Northern teams yeah. or Welsh teams. Yeah. So there was that extra bit. And it wasn't because it was just a, it wasn't because the kids, we didn't like each other, mm. it was the parents, right? It yeah. was 100% like, you'd go to a, an under 16s or an under 18s game and yeah. the parents would come and you could feel the parents was like, <laughs> you're Northerners, <laughs> we're Southerners. And it was like that thing from the start. And like not in a, it wasn't, it wasn't really horrible, but it was like, we would make the jokes about it, mm. but then it was like, well, it comes down to it. I was like, I don't want to let you guys win. Yeah. Um, and we were a, a southern, a southern team, and we went through quite a lot. Like the when I got into the London Broncos team, when we were playing in the under 18s. Our our squad was all London guys, and mm -hmm. I'd probably say roughly 50% of our team was black as well. Right. Okay. So when we would travel up north, yeah, it would be it would be quite an eye opening experience, and it was the first time. Not just at the north, but like if you go to Wales and stuff like that. I think you go to Featherstone, if you go to like the real deep yes. parts of the country, yeah. it was probably back then, which feels like a long time ago. I was 18, so what, 16 years ago. Yeah. Like a lot of black people around was nothing. Yeah. And I think a lot of people struggled to come to terms with like what was going on and there was a lot of racism in the, in the game. And I remember one particular game we were playing Featherstone away and someone made a, like a really horrible comment. I, I didn't hear it, but we were walking off at half time. Yeah. I remember just one of the lads snapped, he jumped over the thing. And as a team, you kind of learn to, you're in it together. Yes. Even at 18, yeah. you, you, you live in and breathe in it. And you got, we all like kind of flew in, flew mm -hmm. over. And the other players were like, we were going mad at each other. And then, yeah, it was like the first time that I was like, shit, like that's an actual, that's an actual thing. Like. Mm -hmm. Taking the piss out of each other north and south was was fine, like. Yeah. But when you heard your mate like getting like that, you're like, shit, puts things in perspective. So, not necessarily that doesn't happen now, and it was such a rare occurrence, but it was one of those things that like shit. Really, like, yeah, yeah, really, yeah, really eye opening. That. Yeah. Especially at a young age, you're like, you grow up pretty quick when you you hear that stuff going on. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Wow, uh, it's it's what well it's one of them, especially with. Like we said, we would believe that that passion and intensity, and I felt that. I know you said that you grow up quite quick, quickly, but some players just don't have the emotional intelligence to actually control their emotions. Um, when you were like at that age, were you? Did you feel like the experiences from you know rugby union kind of maybe? made you a bit more, not like intelligent, but a bit more, you know, a bit more privy to it all. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I definitely feel like, um, and it's one thing that I would say I'm still quite good at now, is, is being aware of, of situations and, yeah. and understanding like the vibe of somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'd probably say I wasn't able to control it when I was younger. Okay. I would say I'd get really annoyed if I couldn't do something or if I wasn't, the highest achiever or anything like that. And I wouldn't say like I was very extremely talented. I, I, 
when I was growing up, considering I'm in fitness now, fitness is my life, mm -hmm. I absolutely hated doing fitness. Right, okay. And I wasn't very fit when I played sport. Right. I would say I was very good at the sport. Yes. Um, which probably was to my detriment. If I was worse at the skills, mm. I'd probably have worked a little bit harder at the other things. Right, okay. Because I could always be at the level of the other fit people because I knew how to get around the field. I yeah. knew what was happening next. I was in control of it. But yeah, I'd probably say if I was slightly less skillful, not to say I was really skillful, but I was skillful enough to like know how to get around the park. Yeah. Probably if I had to run a bit harder <laughs> or like actually lift some weights, I'd probably be a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't, it would have been a lot better. It was, uh, it was funny, I was listening to uh, Gary Neville on a podcast the other, the other week and uh, he was in about him being in the team for United. And he said him and his brother just got in there off pure, pure hard work. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was obviously still in the team when he was, you know, 35, 36. And he said the only reason why he was still in that team at that point was one, because uh, of the effects they had in the dressing room, obviously, but also, like you said, the awareness on the pitch, like mm -hmm. being able to read, read the game. Um, and I think, I think that's it's definitely a, an underrated skill. And especially like be in coaching as well, where being able to read a room, being able to, you know, tell what the vibe is when you're kind of talking to someone, it's yeah. it's a very much a, an underrated skill. Um, so like, what other experiences when you were younger do you think helped develop, develop that? Um, I think being always around and being always in team sports mm -hmm. um, made, made me much better in social situations because yeah. you are more regularly exposed to them. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, um, considering what I do for work, I'm, I'm very much a, an extrovert at work, mm -hmm. but then when I'm away from work, I really enjoy my, like, my own time and my own like noise. So yeah. as in, I don't really do much. I just mm -hmm. chill out and then when I work at work. So I kind of learned that when I was at school, I was probably the the guy that when I was at, when I was on I was on but when I was quiet I'd be like oh is he all right kind yeah, of thing and I was yeah. I was fine and I am fine but it's uh, yeah I think it's quite a hard one to answer I don't know why maybe I got lucky like my parents are are quite clued up like they they are socially aware and like they they know they got their heads screwed on kind of thing mm -hmm. which I think always helps if you if you what, spend 18, 20 years of your life what, what do they do. So my dad is, or still is, a like print finisher. Works in like right. manual labour of picking up paper, getting a cut, yeah. and that kind of stuff, or bookbinder. Uh -huh. And my mum, when I was younger, she didn't work. And then when I went to school, she started to work, um, kind of in account, not account. She's not an accountant, but she worked in like finance, mm -hmm. payroll. Worked for Aer Lingus for a long time um, yeah. in in the UK, and then yeah, yeah she still works doing that stuff now. So. Kind of, they were always present, like mm -hmm. the the typical growing up of like your dad would go to work, come back, mum would be in charge at home, and then the like I think I said this to you before the dynamic change, which I think for my dad was very difficult because yeah. he was the breadwinner, and yeah. then his trade is shrinking mm -hmm. as everything becomes more tech based, and um, obviously finance is always there to stay. Yeah. Um, so it kind of went to the point where my dad was then earning less, my mum was the breadwinner, and then that whole switch was probably quite hard for them. Right. Um, I think it was quite good for me. Like I have a, a seven year old daughter and I always understand the roles and responsibilities are very much equal now and balanced yeah. Than yeah. as opposed to back in the day, it was like you, the old man goes to work, the mum stays at home and mm -hmm. that's the kind of way it goes. I think nowadays it's whoever, whoever gets to the top gets to the top kind of thing. Yeah. And then the other person, the other person like, has to, to carry behind. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting as well. I think uh, on just coming back to your, like when you said in social, social situations, it's kind of like you're quite extroverted. Um, and I'd say I'm a little bit similar, similar in that sense where I try to be as present as possible. And you're really good at that. Like when you're speaking to people and um, you know, you're coaching them or doing anything, you can see like you're really on it. You're super present, you're super aware, but I'm the same in the sense that if when I'm away from everyone and when I'm, like that situation's finished, like I just need that time to myself to kind of because it's you're just so on all the time, especially yeah. like yesterday, for example, with a, a seminar at Industry 13 from half ten till 
till half five and like after that for probably like half an hour in the car afterwards me and you were just sat in yeah. silence we were like we just needed that time just to you know just to chill um i, I used to struggle to be able to switch off mm -hmm. i think um i heard uh james, james smith did a post podcast or, or i heard it somewhere and um he was about like rationing your energy mm -hmm. and and that, that was a really good thing for me it was like use use your energy when you need it and when, and when, you, when you have to use it and then like save your energy in certain like experiences mm -hmm. like learn to say no to certain things and then learn to okay how much energy do i need to give at certain times i think as crossfit coaches and like technically presenters when you're you're in the gym you're like okay i'm coaching at six coaching at seven can't be shit because you're thinking about your 8 a.m yeah. like training session or you can't, i'm not thinking about yeah. that anyway but i'm thinking of like how good could i be at six and seven i had the opposite problem i'd give so much energy at six and seven and then try and carry that energy into training or into just the conversation straight after i just absolutely drain myself and i think that affected home life like kind of get back i'd be exhausted like wouldn't be able to give as much energy into my relationships and, and things like that so you kind of learn to like manage it and balance it and now i'm like okay i can coach i can be on i can help and then i can like right i'm training and my brain it's just able to go into a different mode and i think routine and consistency really helps that yeah. um obviously on, on the athlete plan the movement mechanics hip stuff yeah. it's my 10 15 minutes of transition mm -hmm. it's transitioning me from what i've been doing work wise or if i've just traveled in yeah into okay i'm gonna work out now or i've been doing a squat program like death by a thousand squats course, kind yeah. of thing <laughs> it's like just getting myself into the right frame of mind to then go um and that's like trying to build that into my routine. I think if I would go straight from one thing straight into like doing some lunging and squatting, I'd be like, no, I, I can't do that now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that takes time. And I think that takes um, just trying to, to back off a second before mm -hmm. you then go forward. And on a similar note there as well, and I heard this from, um, she's called Charlotte, Jodie Shaw. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so again, she did a podcast and she said she was working with like a, therapist or a life coach or something like that but she gave a, a really good analogy that he gave her in that some days when she's doing like loads of media and it's you just know it's going to be a really intense long day it's like right that's my kind of high day mm. and usually immediately after that she makes sure that the next day she's not really got much on or there's much less and then there's obviously days where it's kind of in the middle mm. so very similar to training in the sense that it's going to be a day where it's super intense, but then the day after, you put, it's probably one of them where it shouldn't be as intense. Or if you do have two days in a row, it's like, right, the next couple of days have definitely got to be, got to be more chilled. So I, I, that kind of really stuck with me because I was mm. like, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, that's really, that's really good. I think, you, I think people listening to this will get the, I'm good for like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then I try and go Thursday or like I'm hanging on and then it's like, okay, well, can I be productive at the back end of the week? And you're like, well, you're not. Yeah. It's, it's, it's learning to, it's learning to undulate that, that effort and that intensity. And exactly. I think we had, I've had a few days of it where we was into work, leak in the house, mm -hmm. kind of like traced back all of my steps. I was like, it's, this is going to be, I'm going to be full on here until like I get to Wigan on like Friday afternoon. Then it was like, relax a bit, good sleep reset me and then I was like I know I can then sustain it yeah. whereas if it was like a shorter sleep then straight in another couple of days I think it'd be like I'd be sick by Monday mm -hmm. um so yeah it's uh it's definitely worth trying to map out your week and I think that's where being prepared yes. is uh it's hugely important yeah it is I think just being aware of that little fact as well is because obviously some, some days stuff will crop up like you did with your house mm -hmm. and you can't you can't really control that but it's kind of the next day and I make sure it's a little bit more low key. Um, the other thing that you, you mentioned about kind of the, the balance and like balance in work and, and family, I'm still really trying to find my way there, especially um, with being self employed and my, how I've always been. Like, so my family's are farmers, so they work from, they had some milkman as well, so they work from like 4 30 in the morning all the way through pretty much to like five, six o'clock in the evening. Mm. So that's kind of been ingrained in me. It's like, you just graft, you work for long hours, you just keep going. And 
same when, especially like when you can work at home, yeah. like my laptop's there, it's like, oh, I could just do this extra bit, I could just do this extra bit. Jack T's ready, it's like, yeah, but I'm in a minute, Jack T's ready, do you know what I mean? And it, it, I just find it so hard not to, you know, just keep working, but it's, mm -hmm. it's like, Hannah needs that time as much as, you know, what work does as well, because she's, you know, to be a champion on the field, you've got to be a champion at home first. Mm -hmm. They're the people that are going to support you, help you, get you through your good times, your bad times. So, yeah, I'm still mm -hmm. trying to find that balance. Yeah, I think you said something about control there, which I think is um, a really important. Like, you can only control what you can control, like the old control the controllables yeah. conversation. Um, I think one thing that I try to think about is I can't control sometimes the situation, but I can control how I react to the situation. Mm -hmm. And like, let's use that leak on a, on a Thursday. Like I had a moment, I was just about to leave the house to go to work and then water started coming through my ceiling onto yeah. the floor. And I knew I was going to be away from basically three, four <laughs> days. I was like, I can't just leave the house with water running in it. I need to deal with the situation. And I had a very, I probably had maybe five to 10 minutes of, like, what am I going to do here? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Just walk pissing on the TV. Like, I need to go upstairs. All of those kind of things. And then I was like, all right. Walked around a bit. Just stood in stood in the front room for like a couple of minutes. Just didn't say anything to myself. And I was like, right. Okay. Can't deal with that. I can only deal with this. Yeah. Spoke to a few people. Managed to organise some stuff. And then I left the house. And then by the time I got to the train station, I was like, right that's done now. Mm -hmm. Like, whereas I think previously, like years gone by, that would, that would be eking me away. Yeah. And then that would have a knock on effect. I'd go and coach, I was coaching at 12. I would have been a really bad coach at 12 because yeah. I'd been thinking about it. I'd have been stressed out. I had a programming chat straight after it with Holly and all of those things would have just not been as good as what they should have been. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like you can control how you react to situations and it's not easy, but it's just slowing it down, mm -hmm. being okay. I just genuinely, if I could have gone up and told the guy not to run that tap mm -hmm. before he ran it, I would have done, yeah. but I couldn't. Yeah. So it's like, I can't control that. It's happened yes. now. Yeah. It's like, okay, let's fix these problems and, and move it forward. And it, that's that emotional intelligence <laughs> yeah. shining through from years on a rugby pitch and, and everything else uh, life's thrown at you. Um, there was something else you said before as well with that that decompressing and mm -hmm. like you did in that situation similar there we thought um and we say this quite a bit before you go into your training you know make sure you've got five ten minutes either we kind of just having a bit of time to yourself to decompress from work or whatever it was you were doing before training to reset and be like right i'm doing this next task now and again that's where you're really good at being like i'm in this moment now i'm you know getting to work on on what I'm doing. Yeah, um, yeah you, you've got to be all in in, in your situations, not necessarily like a, a, a million miles an hour all in, but if I'm having a conversation with you, I'm having a conversation with you. Yeah. If I'm talking to a group, I'm, I'm talking to a group. What I, I, I've i noticed, and I've had encounters and I've probably done it myself, but I'm now acutely aware of it. If I'm having a conversation with someone and they're not in the conversation, they're thinking about something else or their their mind somewhere else, it's like, so what are we actually getting from that that yes. interaction and yeah. that that can be really tough because it's been my boss previously and i've been having a conversation with them and i'm telling them one thing but they're thinking about something else i'm mm -hmm. like okay like i've got to persist because it is you are my boss but at the end of the day it's like i've got to move on and, and, and get it going kind of thing. yeah you can sometimes you can see when you're in a conversation with people and they kind of they checked out a little bit and there's times where i'm speaking to them and i'm like I know you're not really listening to this and I'm losing motivation in telling you what yeah. I'm saying you're like, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> um, let's uh, fast forward a little bit to like the post rugby days now. Mm. Um, so you worked at Nuffield Health. Yeah. And at what period were you, were you like, right, this is, this is the thing for me. Mm. Did you find out during rugby? And then let's talk about kind of the next phase. Of yeah, I, I think there was, um, so with the rugby, it was kind of everything for about seven years. Mm -hmm. um, like all in, doing everything around it. Like the, you got paid to do it. 
it was you'd have like little sideline things, but they weren't the priority. The goal was like to try and get on the field in the first team at the end of the week, yeah. and and that was tough. But like the Super League team, the London Broncos team that I was in was like they were good. Yeah. Like, made up of, of all Aussies, Kiwis. <laughs> I mean, like Tommy Ludewi was in the team, right. and he played a similar position to me. <laughs> like he was a young lad. I mean, I'm, and he's out now for Wigan, and you just I can't fathom the fact that he's now retiring. Like. I'm like, I still feel good. Uh, <laughs> if I'd have played Super League for like 15 years, I probably wouldn't be feeling <laughs> yeah, good. Um, yeah. So you kind of you get to that point where I was like, this isn't this isn't panning out like to be like a career player. Like there was a couple of guys. So Lou McCarthy, Scarsbrook, um, he went and signed for he was in the Broncos first team, but then went and signed for Saints, and obviously won got all the got all the rings, like win it every year kind of thing. Still going. Tony Club went up. Um, up to Wigan as well, mm -hmm. um, and a couple of boys like Mike and, and Addy, they, they kind of went over to Hull and, and kind of dotted around the club. So I didn't get those moves or, or go to the, like go for those moves. Um, so I kind of knew that it was what am I going to do now? Yeah. Uh, London Scholars were was an opportunity, so that was like not Super League, it was Championship, maybe League One, and but it was part time. It was in North London, mm -hmm. and it kind of sit really well with. I was I got a PT qualification done because mm -hmm. I was in the gym doing the rehab on my knees and, and all that kind of stuff. And then the gym thing kind of was quite fun. Like it was the social element that I was continuing to like. Yeah. And then just fortunately, like the CrossFit thing was so fortunate, right place, right time. A guy called Tim was one of the PTs as well. Um, and one of the other guys just like threw him a magazine and in it was like, the, it was a men's health and it was like, try this stupid CrossFit workout kind of thing. <laughs> and I say it was a filthy 50, oh, like okay. 50 reps of each thing. Yeah. It was very much in and around the time where that, the 300 workout was mm -hmm. like bougie. It's like, oh, you can look like Gerald Butler without <laughs> taking gear, but just do this workout. And I was like, why not? <laughs> um, so I think he had a go, I had a go, and he had a triathlon on my Ironman background, and I had like the, the more explosive sport, and yeah. we got very similar time. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, yeah. this shouldn't happen. Yeah. I should be in your stronger. And he's like, <laughs> I should beat you because you're, I'm fucking fit. Yeah. Um, so then it was just kind of like started to do a little bit more, and we were in a regular gym just like doing CrossFit.com. Mm -hmm. um, and then this like, Gonna call him skinny. I'm gonna call him skinny. Mm. This this skinny guy with a massive neck <laughs> called Ben. Called Ben like just started like doing his normal gym stuff. Um, like at really not peculiar times, but just at, at, at strange times of the day. And I was like, "Who are you?" And he's like, "Oh, I'm a cameraman. Like do camera work. I'm just trying to get stronger and stuff." And he was just doing bench and yeah. wasn't doing calf raises. <laughs> yeah. like, I mentioned it once. He wasn't doing. Calf. I think he might have actually done some of that stuff. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, he wasn't genetically predisposed to those. <laughs> but yeah, he got he got obscenely strong very quick. Mm -hmm. He was like, God, you're strong. Yeah. Like he he wasn't big, but he really had a good tall frame on him and I was like, God, he got really strong. Like he was pressing the same dumbbells as me, and I, I was like, Wow, like I'm bigger than you, but you're stronger. Yeah. Um and then he just started to get stuck into that CrossFit with Tim and it was like it just grew from there and then there was like a little group of us that were just like doing the odd workout a couple of other members would see us and then tim and i just started using it with our clients right, PT okay. clients and that's where it was like you the pt work just went through the roof right you, because people were like that looks fun yeah like i want to learn how to do that or teaching people how to olympic lift um teaching people to get upside down I remember like one of my first clients a guy called michael broughton and um, he was he was well and truly in this crossfit thing and um, he, I remember, like, he, I made all the mistakes with him. Right. Okay. Like, from a coaching perspective, I made all the mistakes. <laughs> and he made all of them as well. Like, oh, when I tell him, I've told him this, and uh, he'll agree. He was doing a banded pull up, the band slipped between his legs, smacked him in the nuts. <laughs> like, on snatching, he'd whack himself on the head from the bar. Uh, he's fallen on his head on a handstand um, multiple times. I remember, like, we had like a little space next to the squat rack. It was tiny. It was like mm -hmm. not safe, but we were like, go on, get up there. Got him up there, and he just crumbled in the heat. And you're like, oh, oh, okay. so doing all those things, yeah. tripping over a box, like yeah. you name it, he's done it. Yeah. But like kind of learning, and then from those experiences, is like learning to, okay, well, I don't, I don't think they enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy the feeling of hurting someone. So it was <laughs> like, I need to fix how I kind of yes. get, get to that point. Yeah. So kind of you learn from those experiences. Mm -hmm. That was. That was CrossFit that was born. Like we were, I mean, the stepping forward on the burpees thing was something that 
we didn't do burpees, but if we stepped forward or stepped backwards, step backwards, you'd drop a snatch on a cross trainer. Yeah. If you step forward, you'd drop it onto someone on a bench. Right. So you learn to just do it in, yeah. the, in a space. You yeah. had a carpet square <laughs> space. Um, and we learned very quickly like when to and when not to like lift if someone was walking in front of you and, and, yeah. and that kind of stuff. So but that awareness, if you're down in a snatch, and I think a lot of people will know this, if someone breathes funny and you're so like highly strung, mm. you can feel it. Yeah, you can yeah. feel someone walk yeah. in the room and wait and you're if there. And I think that it take, took me a long time to like realize now, like I do a lot more classes, I get stuck mm -hmm. into classes mm -hmm. and sometimes members are just not aware, like you're going for a heavy lift, you just get used to it. And I think you guys would probably be more inclined to know like if the cameraman's going in front of you. Yeah. And just right there, you like you can't not make the lift now. Mm -hmm. You just got to ignore it. Yeah. Um, but when you first start, and if you're just in a normal gym, like the situation needs to be perfect, otherwise you can't get it right. <laughs> um, what what sort of time was was this? Like what what mm -hmm. kind of where were we? So I was like in the context of me, I'd probably say I was twenty one, twenty two. Okay. Um, so what? I've been doing rugby like from a really early age, full time. Yeah. And then, I, the CrossFit thing, so I did my level one in 2012 in, mm -hmm. in Wales. The reason I remember it is because it was the weekend of that Super Saturday at the Olympics. Okay. So I was, wow. in, I was in Swansea and they'd put a big screen up and I was like, last time I'd been to Wales before that was that Merthyr <laughs> trip. So I was like, they don't really like the English, um, but everyone was, uh, like, he was, Mo was British, right? And I went, most of Mo Farrell went to my school. Right. Um, like for a fleeting minute like yeah. in and around Hounslow and Isle right. yeah. and uh, so obviously just watching him mm -hmm. fucking demolish the field I mean goal second I think it was the second goal that Super Saturday or, or the first one but yeah it was a good atmosphere and so yeah I've been done my level one and that was did the level one and I was like this is unreal right this is fucking sick yeah I've done a PT qualification so you learnt the anatomy which I thought was good and it helped but it didn't teach you how to present mm -hmm. it didn't teach you how to captivate an audience and on my level one I think Adrian well, Bosman was there Adrian right. Bosman but I think he was watching Carl Stedman and Matt Evans like go through their like flow master kind of yes. style stuff yeah um, I don't I, I don't know if that's correct but I'm pretty sure like from my own experience of doing some of that stuff that's the kind of flow that happened so obviously seeing Bosman was like you're a celebrity in my eyes. Like <laughs> Castro, Glassman and Bosman were like the three people in America that weren't actually athletes that I was like, like if I meet you, I'm like, yeah, yeah. Go, the world's the world's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like he just had a great manner about him and, and I am very much not a very good reader, but I'm a very good listener and, and rememberer of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um and I still remember that level one. I still remember the the workout. We did Fran. I don't think you do Fran anymore. No. Um, but we did Fran. Ah, oh, shit, pull ups. Still pull ups. <laughs> but I was quite good at thrusters. Right. So I was able to put myself in, a, in an absolute hole. Um, and yeah, it was uh, never looked back. Just took all of the information. I was like, loved it. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, been doing the CrossFit stuff kind of ever since, yeah, 10 years. Were you, uh, were, were you kind of dabbling on, in your PTs in CrossFit before you did that? Um, yeah, yeah, before yeah. level one. So yeah. probably from 20 years old. So for a couple of years, was kind of looking at dot com like mm -hmm. read i think it was really interesting i saw adrian conway post um about checking dot com and yeah. the journal articles I'd read everyone yeah like looked at every single one mm -hmm. and some of them were i'd be like oh they're not going to help me but i'd just look at it anyway yeah like, there'd be like one on like gymnastics like, oh how to build parallels but mm -hmm. i just looked at it just because it was like the there wasn't as many websites. There, well, there wasn't. There, there wasn't, wasn't many. It's yeah. just dot com. Yeah. Like, no, the only online programming that you would see was not Westside Barbell. What's the guy with the skull and crossbone? Um, Outlaw Way. Outlaw. Yeah. Like Outlaw Way was like one of the early early adopters yeah, to like doing that stuff. Yeah. So I looked at that, and then I think in terms of learning the movements, I remember Ben, Tim, and I, we were in the gym and we'd, we'd watch Ben do it. Mm. And then our reference point was Jason Kalipa, right. Rich Froning and Chris Fila. Yeah. And we're like, Ben, it, it doesn't look like Chris Fila. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go, what does it need to look like to look like Chris Fila? And then Ben would work it out. Yeah. Like, he, obviously, you've met Ben and a lot of people will have, have come across Ben, who's Mr. Rap now. Um, he just learned how to do it. And I was like, 
I've now watched him learn how to do it so that I learned how to teach it, which was mad. Like that's how we learn how to coach. Yeah. Like Tim had a very, very methodical and, and thought driven process on and to building things. So that was good. I was more of like the raw emotion. I was like, just go and try it. Yeah. Go and try it. And Tim was like, why don't you try this one first and then this one? And then it that started to grow. And then like between the three of us, um, it kind of got to the point where it was like, we've got this quite clever way of like delivering exercise and yeah. it sat along the level one. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, good to go. I, I do, th- I still think that's a, a really, something that a lot of athletes struggle to do or don't do is look, look at someone that does it very well and try to copy them. Yeah. That's how I learned to do yeah. weightlifting gymnastics like I looked at I watched weightlifting videos and I was like my life clean doesn't look quite like yeah. that so um I'm not doing something quite quite right but I think for for me I picked that up off my my grandpa when I was sailing because he was always like you should be constantly making just little tweaks and, and stuff to your technique and always look to refine it and make it a little bit better a little bit more efficient um but I think athletes can be watching the videos backwards and taking note, right, how does it look? Should it look like that or should it look like what, I don't know, yeah. Matt Fraser's doing or you I know think, what I mean? Yeah, I think that is, is so, so important. I, I think even within the context of the sport now, it's moved to the point where doing a movement a certain way creates a certain cadence. Yes. And then within that cadence, that allows you to then potentially breathe, move, recover, whatever it needs to be. Mm -hmm. I think a great example is, if you want to mirror someone on a movement is, you watch Matt Fraser on the shoulder to overhead when they only have five people at the games, where it's the long row, bar muscle up, shoulder to overhead. There's no music, and it taught me how to breathe on a shoulder to overhead. And you watch the other athletes who are right up. I couldn't get anywhere near what they do, mm-hmm. but you, they make they look like amateurs yeah. compared to how I know you meet like someone will say, "Oh, we missed that last mm-hmm. one." Fucking hell, he's marvelous. Yeah, like yeah, it was yeah. one of those ones where you watch the the tension, the breathing, the execution on that shoulder to overhead, and you're like, "That is how you do shoulder to overhead mm-hmm. with, I'd say, moderate to heavy weight." Yes, and you're yeah. like, "Right, watch the other guys." I mean. You pull out Noah Olsen, you're like, just see the inefficiencies. I know he had shoulder problems, but it's like, he's slid back, he's losing tension. You're like, Matt Fraser was like, tch, tch. Mm-hmm. you could hear it. And you're like, all right, if you're going to model yourself off something, that's what you've got to do. And then you just look at those people across all the, I mean, for males, you've got to look at males because of the body dimensions and stuff. And for yeah. the female, like we take the kip swing, mm-hmm. it, it is slightly different, male to female. Mm-hmm. And the one outlier is the best athlete in the world is Tia. Yeah. You watch her do ring muscle ups. She ring muscle ups like a dude. Yeah, she does. Um, she's got the upper body muscle yeah. density to be able to do it. Yeah. Whereas the other ladies rely on a much more lengthened kip swing to create yeah. tension to their abs. Whereas Tia's just got shorter, sharper abs. Yeah. And then it's like, bosh. And there's, there's so many, like CrossFit athletes, they're, they're, they're pretty, the ones that are like maybe semi-pro or pro, um, I know they're, they're pretty intense and they're on top of everything. But if we, for example, so we're based in Wigan Warriors facility and they watch videos of ma- previous matches um, on a pretty much a daily basis yeah. and for some people like we said they watch and they learn and that's the best way for them to pick stuff up mm-hmm. um and if you know or you have an idea that you learn well that way watch videos of athletes and do your do your kind of homework and your research there as to what what are the best people doing in that area and we're going to try and find out and watch videos of that person doing that video video review is very humbling mm-hmm. um Obviously, my first exposure to it was like you'd watch your your review of the game, mm-hmm. and there'd be certain elements that were positive, negatives, or then we'd get a review of like the next team, like okay, there's their go to. They always play left edge to then a big shot right, and you're like, okay, I'm prepared for it. it doesn't fix it, but yeah. it just means that you're ready for it. Yeah. And then yeah, with that video review, I think nowadays everyone is filming themselves and they're just putting it on Instagram. It's like, well, actually, like look at look yeah. at what you're doing. And then work out like why you're doing those things. Yeah. Um, I remember from a coaching perspective, I uh, James Hobart um, posted a long time ago. It's like 
if you want to really know how you coach, film a class unedited and watch it back. Mm -hmm. And then I think at the bottom is like, you will hate the first 10 minutes. <laughs> and I did, and I filmed it, and it was horrific because you can then identify, you can already see it. Like if you are slightly aware and I was like filming it and then in the middle of it, I was like, oh, I'm gonna watch this back. There's too long there. There's not enough here. Like that person over there is not doing it right. Yeah. But once you do it once, you then become comfortable with that difficult situation. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, all right, how do I make it better next time? And, yeah. and it is quite exposing um, because we do coach development stuff where you watch someone and you give them feedback, mm -hmm. which is good. But then if you can spot your own mistakes, next time you can make that correction before it even becomes a mistake. Exactly. And then you're like, wow, I'm in control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on, on that point, when you said, you know, loads of people are just posting the videos on Instagram, like they'll just chop it, put it on. Um, and I messaged an athlete the, the other day um, who put a video on and he was doing hand power snatches uh, at like a light to moderate weight. And when he was bringing the bar down, his arms were still bent. And I just messaged him saying, hey mate, don't know if you kind of realise that your arms are still bent, like, you know, when you're bringing it down, um, just don't want you to get to competition and get busted, busted for that. Um, and he was like, oh, sorry, I didn't kind of realise that I was doing it. And it's like, people are videoing some of themselves, but not actually really taking note of the, you know, mm -hmm. the finer details that they should be improving on. It's just kind of like, there's so much stuff, it's just kind of, it just all becomes a blur, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, it's the understanding of why you're filming, mm -hmm. like use it to your advantage, like potentially, I know like in, in CrossFit at, at that kind of intermediate to advanced level, you, you have like sponsor obligation to post and, and things like that, like with the, the can of sports drink or the, the booty short of choice in the shop, <laughs> but ultimately like use that as a secondary like reason to do it, like right, I'll post that and I'll get paid that, but then like use it to your advantage because mm -hmm. I guarantee the, the people that are the best get paid the most to do those posts. Yeah. So you might as well like use it, watch it back. Like, okay. Um, I always find it quite peculiar if someone posts something and it's horrific. Mm -hmm. Like unless they're posting it in jest and they're making a joke of it, which yeah. I'm very much a big fan of. Like yeah. I don't take myself seriously at all. <laughs> um, or like for me, I'm doing this squat program at the minute. I think like I post the old lift not to boast because it, they're not very, amazing lifts compared to what I've done previously and what mm. I was doing. Yeah. It's more my accountability factor. Yes. Yeah. It's like, okay, cool. Show like, it, it, this is tough. This process does take a long time. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to resonate with some people. So in my small following that I have. <laughs> I think uh, for me, with Instagram and, and that sort of stuff now, I'm always aware of like, or I'm more aware now of actually what I, I do post. So it used to be like all training videos now, but mm. now it's much more balanced. But it's obviously that balance where sometimes you wanna, you post work stuff, but I don't want people to have the perception that my life is just consumed by, you know, yeah. by CrossFit the whole time, because, it, because it's actually, mm. it's not. Um, and that's, I, always say to athletes, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Mm. Um, you know, you should have a few different baskets because if you drop a basket, that's when you have a complete meltdown and you fall out of love with, you know, doing it and, and everything else. So I think, you know, just... Also, like, if you're right at the top level of the sport, like, you've got to keep your calves slightly closer to your chest. Yes. I think if we use Matt Fraser as an example, he now, well, he doesn't post much about his performance because he knows it's not an elite level anymore. Mm -hmm. Like he would still be an elite level athlete, but yeah. his perception is I need to be everyone in everything. Mm -hmm. um, whereas like when he was competing, he didn't post anything. Yeah. It wasn't, it, it wasn't like the, if you think of his priorities and you look at um, him, there's a, there's a few people right at the top of the sport, like we'll, we'll get into Dave because we've been, I've rewatched the video <laughs> and we'll have to link the video in of, of the, the perfect transition um, uh, coming out of a swim into a gun um, by the biggest human being ever known. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like if once you get to those levels, like your priority list and, and what, you're, what you're doing becomes even more important um, to really like hit the levels you want to hit or go to the next level. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, let's, let's mention that, that David moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm, uh, let's talk about David. Actually. Let's talk like, about yeah, David. David's an amazing guy. Like I, I never met him 
to like speak to him and know him but I'm quite fortunate that the environment I like started doing my CrossFit career in these guys called Ben and Tim mm -hmm. um, opened a CrossFit gym called Blitz um, which is in Twickenham and I said to them like as soon as you open a gym I was like give me a job like, I'll coach you at CrossFit yeah. I was doing my other like Nuffield health job mm -hmm. got myself a mortgage to buy a house and like I want to say we bought a house in a September and then they opened in the October right. and then in the November I was like trying to quit my full-time job to like try and do this yeah. with a proviso that they were giving me like four hours a week worth of work <laughs> and I was like right just knocking on the door getting it um, but Ben was very very good at CrossFit before the gym opened but mm -hmm. then he became exceptionally good and qualified for 2014 European regionals yeah as a gym we had a great community we just went bosh straight over to, to Copenhagen and then that was the like first big UK year. Mm -hmm. So you had Steve, you had Mitch, you had Dave Shonkey, like Ben, like loads of people, I think possibly Alec Harwood, um, oh, Matt, well, um, yeah, Matt Rubel, yeah, yeah that's um, what Rob Manor. Oh, yeah. Like you think about it's it, like, like they're all like if you Lee, think of those names, Lee, Lee Howell, Howell yeah, well. would have been in there. Yeah. So many. And it was just a good experience to like watch Ben throw down. He'd come eleventh or something like that in mm -hmm. Europe. You're like, wow, like really and then yeah, Dave was there and they're like he, he was he resonated with me because he was a slightly bigger crossfitter mm -hmm. so i was like well like, i'm six foot six yeah. or anything like that <laughs> but I'm, I'm bigger than the normal crossfitter yeah. and um yeah i was like oh he's like cool dude he, he carried himself and he had th this presence that like when he walks around people are like he's Is got it? a good presence he's calm yeah. he's assured it's like that kind of stuff and then yeah just watched him kind of develop and then obviously he's had a, a few years where some injuries and stuff and then hadn't seen him in person for a while because he hadn't been competing. Mm. And I went up to have a meeting with Steve and Ben, I think Ben, and, and then Dave and Emma were coming over mm -hmm. for something. They met us. I remember he walked in the room and I remember me and Ben looked at each other and we were like, fucking hell. <laughs> He's massive. Yeah. He's massive. Ben. Like, and then before I could even like mention it, Ben was like, you're massive. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, I know I've been doing bodybuilding and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, like, and then obviously now we know he can shift, um, mm. did amazingly well in Madrid and now he's in Marbella just absolutely tearing it a new one. Um, but the, I think the thing, reason we're getting onto that is his attention to detail Yes, is something that you, if, if you haven't experienced it, you, you, can't, you can't understand it. People will think that he's being too finicky, but you're like, this is exactly how it should be done. Yeah. And within our core programming team that we have, you need someone like that. Yeah, so like, I think our team is very well balanced in terms of, if you think of my role is to just like, throw ideas in there that are like, if someone can catch that and run with it, let's, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Like a pie in the sky, kind of more of a realist, like what a member wants. Dave's more of like that structured approach. Like Jack, you're, you're the, the guy that actually puts this shit together because we'll throw ideas in there or like scenarios and we'll be like, well, I don't even know how to <laughs> begin with that. And then you, like, all of a sudden, a week later, have a structure to actually do it. And you're like, oh, oh, we can actually do this. As yeah. opposed to if it was just an ideas person, none of them would get done. Mm -hmm. If it was just logistics, none of them would get done because they would just be spent doing that. Yeah. And then feels like the anatomy and then the honest realist man yeah, yes. who's just <laughs> sitting on the Zoom call, <laughs> not saying anything, but you can see he's just waiting. Yeah. He's waiting. And then, yeah. You see like the unmute go off and like everyone goes, <laughs> oh, Phil, you're talking to real talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's going on. So um, yeah, Dave, Dave is um, fantastic. He's got a wealth of knowledge, knows how to structure it. And I think if we, if we ask them the question, why, do, how do you feel like you've got yourself to this structure? Two things have probably come up. Obviously, I listen to his podcast and you can tell he's got a very structured upbringing and lifestyle and that's mm -hmm. helped. But secondly, I think getting injured. Yeah. Getting injured allows you to really focus on what's important and what's not because emotionally you can go one way or the other. And yeah, you can see he's got that right. And then secondly, it was like, how am I going to turn something that's potentially a negative into, into a massive positive? Yeah, definitely. And just to add to what you said, so when David kind of took took on more more programming roles within JST Compete, the amount and the, the details that are in the notes now, I was like, wow, this is this yeah. this has gone up a level now. This is this is really good. Yeah. And uh, the other thing 
as well is the the accountability factor and that environment that, that again you you mentioned before with him and when he came earlier this year uh, and, and reggie was was uh, up in wigan as well like david would be saying to reggie like you know come on pick up your game here like that should be better than you know how it's looking right now or whatever else um and it, it was it was really good and that's how when me and Steve were training together like more seriously we'd be like right that wasn't quite good because of this or we'd kind of you know make sure that we're holding each other to the highest standards and I think a lot of environments that, that don't work out is because there isn't that honesty there and you're not holding each other accountable yeah. um, and it can quickly go downhill from that point mm -hmm. which we found out you know earlier this year we had a few tough lessons this year when we tried to bring a group together in Wigan didn't work out but everyone moves forward and you know you learn as much as you can from it as well yeah I, th I think you um you end up getting to that point where you, you have to identify those people that can raise other people up and from a class perspective that's a very difficult situation it's a business that needs to be run mm -hmm. and you can't you can't select who comes to your gym um, you could, but it might be quite a small group because yeah. your perception of what works is, is probably very small compared to the general community that you have. So it, it's one of those ones that you need to create an environment that is really open and welcoming. And then at the end of the day, CrossFit has this like no dickheads kind of mentality where you don't have to say there's no dickheads. Mm -hmm. But I know at Blitz in the, in the years that I was there that there's only been maybe one or two that have come in and haven't lasted long. Yeah. There, there, there's never been that many people that have gone, stayed in, that have been really, really difficult for the community and they've had to be like crowbarred out. They mostly come in, realise that they're not part of it and then, mm -hmm. and then they leave. And that's the same thing within, you always have the odd person that comes into a team dynamic in, in our squad that was like not the right person, they just don't last very long. Yeah. Um, not because the other people are, are horrible, but they're just, yeah, that honest conversation because the honesty is only going to raise it up. If you go, oh, that's all right. Actually, that's not like the conversation about the person that wants that first pull up. Um, you you say to someone like, you can do all the strict work in, in the world, but if you lost like five, kilo, five kilos, you'd probably get that pull up. Yeah. Um, and then it's initially a very difficult one to say because you don't know how they're going to react. Mm -hmm. But if you say it in a way that's a positive, like mm -hmm. they're gonna go right, they genuinely understand what's going on. Yeah. Like, more likely to get the pull up by losing five kilos and actually trying to get stronger. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, that comes down to like that coaching, you've got to be honest with people. Of course, yeah. Just segueing off segueing off uh, off this then. Um so going into a bit more the coaching mm -hmm. side of things. So you You've got your level three now, but you yeah. also had the opportunity quite a few years ago to be, or got offered a position on, on seminars, CrossFit seminar staff as yeah. well. Do yeah. you want to just tell us a little bit about that, that story first and yeah. how so it played out? That started, I did my level two. So you do your level one um, for people that most, most people are <laughs> So you, 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 you do CrossFit the cult for like a few months and then you're like, right, I might want to make this a job or a hobby. Mm. So you do your level one, which is two days. Um, and then everyone says, oh, I can't believe you can open a gym after two days. And I still think from a structural point of view, I, I feel that it's pretty crazy, but as a business model, it's very clever, right? Yeah. Um, you can get an affiliate fee done the page pretty quickly. Um, but then the level two is probably the, the course that stood out to like change the way I coached massively. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I want to say it was up in Manchester. Carl Stedman was running it again with a, a CrossFit OG. <laughs> And you all sit in a, like not in a circle, but in a group. And then um, they say, oh, what do you want to get out of this course? And they ask everyone. And I, I, was, I was in the middle, I sat in the middle. Um, I normally like to sit at the back, but I think I was just sat in the middle. Um, and when it got to me, I said, oh, I want to do your job, Carl. I said it. Everyone turned around and looked at me. And I like, I needed to then like think, shit, do I provide context? <laughs> I was like, I don't want to take your job. I just yeah. would like to do yes. seminar stuff. Because yeah. I was doing the CrossFit coaching, that was good. And I was filling a, a bucket, but I was like, I thought I could do a bit more and I love mm -hmm. CrossFit. So I said that and he was like, okay, cool. I like that. And then didn't say anything else. And I was like, oh fuck, I'm off, it's not. And then they went through the, the things and then we did, 
I want to say we may have done our first breakout thing of learning some stuff. Yeah. And then he come up to me and he was like, when you said that, what do you mean by that? And I was like, oh, look, I'd like to, if there's an opportunity in the future to do like the seminar stuff and, and that stuff. And he was like, oh, I'll keep an eye on you in this course. And then went through because you do a lot of breakout group coaching yeah. and stuff like that. And I learned a huge amount. I learned like, I delivered, I coached like I, the level one because I'm very much like a, a visual learner. I just mm -hmm. coached it exactly the same. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that was very endearing to what the seminar staff and, and what they want. Yeah. So I've got like an email a month or so later right. saying, oh, you've been recommended to take part in the internship. Right. And I was like, oh my God, this is fucking sick. Like, <laughs> what, what am I gonna do? And they were like, so here's an opportunity. You look for your, you look for level ones um, that are within reason. We don't pay you. We don't provide expenses to go. Right. Like, if you want to do it, do it. And I was like, I want to do it. Okay. So, um, I got myself signed up to, to go and it was in Swansea at Velocity. Matt Evans was the, the flow for the day, I'm pretty sure. And I don't know, I'm going to be seminar staff, like, <laughs> turn up on Friday, got myself ready. I didn't, didn't go meet them. And then I want to say like, on Saturday morning, turn up, got in a, in Velocity, there was like an office, but it was quite small and like, we're all in there. And I'm like, this is JV. There was a guy called Pete Howell, mm -hmm. um, who was doing the internship and he'd done a few sessions. He was on like four or five. And I was like, this is my first one. And Matt Evans just went, what are the progressions for a med ball clean? And I just... <laughs> could not speak couldn't get a word out he was like oh i was like oh stop like, dead lift. like and then i'd like get him to do that he was like no what are the progressions that are in the level one book for a medball clean and i went i don't know and he went you better know by lunchtime and i went i will and then i was sheepish and i just did not <laughs> I was they so on your first internship you don't actually sit, you don't do anything yes. you're, you're there to observe mm. um, you're there to interact with, with the participants kind of in and around the breakout groups and then when it's workout time you can then go and motivate and support and, and get yourself stuck in <laughs> so I did those and then um, like you get you get through the weekend and then I was like driving home just thinking oh my god like they ain't gonna have me back <laughs> and then I did like kind of then knew I'd have to do some coaching to get on it. I really yeah. wouldn't get on one. So I got recommended to go again. Mm -hmm. And the feedback was like very quiet. Like, and I was like, it's because I was fucking scared. Like, <laughs> like, like, not, like, not in a bad way, but just like the presence. I was like, yeah, that's the level I need to be at. Yes. So then I was like, just it took me on a level. And that level two kind of meant that when my coaching at Blitz just went up, I remember Ben and Tim were like, oh my God, like your coaching has gone on the level, yeah. level two. Then you get the, I did another internship at Velocity, which is the second one. This time you coach like one element out of the squat series, one mm -hmm. element out of the pressing, one element out of the, uh, the pull-in series. Thought I did a good job, like it was like, okay, like here's some things to work on. And then the third one was three weeks after my daughter was born, I went to Glasgow. I think we were talking about this yeah, last night, we were having a whiskey. <laughs> um, like Carl was the, the flow on this and it was like this time you're gonna, I didn't know how it evolved. Mm -hmm. I thought I might just do one of each thing. He was like, no, you're gonna coach all the breakout groups. So air squat, front squat, overhead squat, like strict press, push press, push jerk, deadlift, sumo, deadlift, high pull, med ball clean. Glad I remembered that. Um, <laughs> and then you're like, you, you go through it and you get to the end of the day and Carl had like a, a plethora of notes and he was like, Think you, you could you could I could recommend you and I was like this is it it's like so good um, but yeah having a, a kid and everything was just the timing wasn't right so kind of slowed down the process of joining the the, the team mm -hmm. I mean I still like got an email from Dave Castro saying like well done on passing and I was like that's really cool <laughs> uh, I've, I've still got the email I never yeah. did um, <laughs> framed on the wall yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then. Um, and then that was the when the level three was just getting developed. So then a few months later, or quite a long time later, probably a year or so later, I was like, right, maybe I'm ready to do the seminar mm -hmm. stuff and like get on the road and do that stuff. And then they were like, you need your level three. Yeah. I was like, okay. Right. Um, and then yeah, it was uh, do do the level three, which I, I feel is um, it's interesting because it is just an exam to like kind of I, I when I'm coaching classes when we're doing tests, I don't mm -hmm. say this like defines you for one but it just allows you to know where your current level is yeah um 
and then do the do the multiple choice exam passed it was very nervous about again about doing it like when you doubt yourself but mm -hmm. i think that's a good thing i think if you if you you've got to believe that you can pass it and i felt like i could pass it yeah but if you go into it with like i'm definitely going to pass it <laughs> yeah. you're probably going to be like not passing it. Shit <laughs> yeah. um so yeah did that and that got me to my level three I've now had it over three years because i had to renew it um with online courses and, and things like that um but that yeah that seminar staff thing is kind of i'm not sure in my current life like whether it's a an itch that needs scratching okay. if i said that in the correct yeah i think i said that in the correct way yeah um because i don't know like what's going on with everything else in my life so it's like it'd be an opportunity i'd love to help serve the community because i know how good crossfit is and i know how good it can be in terms of when people are delivering it right yeah so it's like why can't we help more people do it and mm -hmm. see the work that carl and, and oaks were doing in like the prisons yeah and like project 180 and you're like this is it. Like, if everyone did CrossFit, we'd save so much money on the health service and all that kind of stuff. I think people would be a bit more clued up, socially aware, so they'd be like less dickheads rolling about yeah. as well, because it's quite a humbling experience, CrossFit. So very much, very much so. I, I, I've, I've, I tell pretty much most people when we're on about you know coaching and stuff, but you are the best coach that I've seen in action, um, like in a class setting. It's you know, it's a, a privilege to, to actually watch you do it. Um, going into that, so what do you think does the CrossFit courses teach very well? And what doesn't it teach that you think is really important that coaches learn as well? Okay, uh, let's, do the, let's do the things that I think the CrossFit does well. Yeah. And then we'll go into the things that I think I've been very lucky with the people that have been around me that have helped mm -hmm. me do um, the next level of like coaching. I think the things that CrossFit do really well is they, they have a clear progression yeah. to get you from A to B mm -hmm. or to C to D. Um, and I think that's hugely important because otherwise you just, where do you start, where do you finish? If you don't have that clear entry point and exit point, it becomes a very befuddled way of delivering yeah. topics and, and movements and and going from a whiteboard to things. And I always found, we used to have coaches meetings at Blitz. We were like, right, we all know how to coach the snatch really well in terms of we can spot the mistake. We're like, well, how do we get to the snatch? Mm -hmm. What are we doing before it? How are we organizing the group? And we were, Blitz is, is and was a very successful gym. Mm -hmm. So we had busy classes. So we tried the two coaches in one room. So 24 people in a class, two coaches rolling, a lead coach and assistant coach. We try that, it worked, it didn't work. Like, how do we make that better? Yeah. Started to refine those things. Um, but then ultimately it come down to having a structure. And I think that's what CrossFit does a very good job of in terms of structuring those progressions. Um, I think the things that were completely lacking which is not any fault of anybody's, but I think there is definitely a market for it, is presenting. Mm -hmm. um, presenting and like being able to talk in front of large groups, how you change everything in your tone of voice, depending on whether you want people to go fast, slower, eye contact, like all of those kind of things are stuff that they can be taught, or they, sorry, they can be like raised as topics to then make people think, can I improve it? But you can't change someone's personality yes. and you shouldn't try to. Yeah. Um, because as soon as like we've done some coach development stuff, I don't want people to coach like me. I want people to coach as best as they can coach because what works for me, my like slight sarcasm, maybe toe the line in terms of my language, mm -hmm. all of those things are all I've learned to do that yes. and I've definitely learned by overstepping the mark mm -hmm. and I've definitely learned by not giving enough and then found that happy balance. So the presenting come from um, one of the members at Blitz he reads the news. Mm -hmm. He reads the BBC news. He's been on my TV. His name's <laughs> Lewis Form Jones and he, he's my biggest failure in CrossFit as a joke. This is a joke by the way. Um, I had a lead and do at Blitz and uh, I remember him saying, like, my the biggest failure Jamie you've ever had has not been able to get me a pull up. Um, because he could do pull ups and he got a muscle up once. And I remember 
again, talking about saying the wrong things. Yeah. I didn't see it, I was in the room, and he gets the bar muscle up, and then I turn around, I hear him, he shouts my name, so I turn around to look at him, and the first thing I said should have been, or the first thing I should have said was, amazing, well done. First thing I did say, I was like, how did you get out there? <laughs> Savage, man. And it was like, not in a way that like, it's just that I just was like, oh, did he hook his foot on something or stand up? Right. And he was like, I did it. <laughs> and I was like, then I was like, amazing. Like, yeah. just my brain just yeah, yeah, yeah. Um So yeah, he was like the biggest failure. But he he used to come to the 9.30 classes, uh, all the lunchtime classes. And I remember we were just talking about, I think the question of David about jobs and, and yeah. stuff like that. And he was like, I'll read the news. And I said as a joke, you need to give me some tips on how to like talk to groups then. And he did. Yeah. He'd like the next day come in or something like that and then he was in a bit early and he was like, here's like a couple of things that really help with presenting. And I'll, I'll give them to you. It was like when you're talking to a group, um, talk to like one person in the group as you're going around the room. So you look at one person in the eye, talk to them, then move on to the next person. So then you're not looking at the whiteboard when you're when you're talking. Yeah. Because I used to have a fat like habit of like reading the whiteboard mm. and then turning my back on the group. Yeah harder to hear and then secondly you can't see whether they're engaging and listening like mm -hmm. you turn your back and everyone could be like hoodie up like, yeah. on their phone <laughs> and you wouldn't even know if they were listening about the workout so that was one thing the other thing was to slow down now as soon as i say this i've said this to a lot of people i will then start doing it <laughs> and you guys can then pick it out <laughs> so when you can't think of something to say rather than filling just don't say anything at all because when you start filling it you go um and basically, um, because all that stuff. Yeah. He says it feels really awkward, but then when you watch it back, it doesn't feel like as long. Yeah. So the um and the slow down was the the, the, the couple of things that were massive game changers for mm -hmm. me. It really helped me sound more calm. And like even now I'm aware of it, my tone of voice has slowed down, I feel a lot more relaxed. So yeah, that's probably the biggest thing that CrossFit coaches don't know how to do mm -hmm. is to present and sometimes the members don't know what you're on about about snatching <laughs> yeah. over the shoulders under the shoulders bar between your legs but if you deliver it in a confident and assured manner they're going to believe you mm -hmm. so sometimes you can get quite a long way with like faking it until you're making it yeah yeah but yeah so. that's the glaring uh, thing that's missing from a a CrossFit coach, which again, at the end of the day, is it important from a safety, efficacy, efficiency, like paradigm? It's like actually, you just want to be safe, mm -hmm. and then the movements are probably the things yeah. that need to be done. But then it's moving on to the next level. It's like what what keeps members coming back? What yeah. makes your business grow? Yeah. It's like your members have got to like your coaches, and they've got to feel comfortable coming, and not just like one of them. Mm -hmm. You've got to like all of them. Yeah. Because that one coach can't coach every day. Yeah. And if they're not the owner of the gym, they'll move on. Um, as you see it happen, like it's happened to me, it's like opportunity wasn't there. It's like time to move on. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you, you learn and you grow from it. Yeah, some great little tips there. Um, I think leading on from that as well, that's that's the the art of becoming a coach like it's not just learning the movements obviously once you do learn the movements like you said with the the level one and level two level three um what are the finer details around that are you good at telling a story can you uh do you have that emotional awareness to to read the room um you know there's actually a lot more to coaching than what most people probably think mm -hmm. um and I'd like to think that what we are trying to do through JC Train uh, like in a class program is, like you said before, we don't want to tell coaches exactly how to do stuff because it's important that they are authentic to, their, to themselves. They'll have a different style. It's important that kind of comes through because that's how people are going to relate to them more. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think Greg, like, so when we delivered the seminar yesterday, we got some, some great feedback from Greg in terms of the members liked it. But then also, there was a nice piece where he wrote about it, gave him some real good food for thought on his coaching. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's someone that's going to get way better at coaching, not because of the information I've given them, just because of his mindset behind it. Yeah. Like he was open and willing to learn new things and he was taking from that what he needs and what he can use. 
And I think that's another that's another whole can of worms on like, all right, you've got to be perceptive to learning new things or taking it. I think we, we both went on the, the red pill weekend, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. Like take take what you want from that, turn it into something that is manageable for like all I wanted to come away with was being out, how can I do this in a class? Mm -hmm. Because that's my job, how yeah. do I do this in a class? Yeah. Because the red pill stuff was fantastic for individuals and one-to-ones. I was like, how do we find like the middle ground yeah. so I can do this with 20 people in a room mm -hmm. because that's my role. Like one-to-one, -one, it's quite easy. You can do a movement assessment and stuff. It's like, how do you scale this to yeah. something different? And no one's got it right. Um, I think on the athlete plan, we are, and Phil has written some amazing like mechanic sessions that have been game changing for the athletes. Like we were, the feedback, people are coming back, they're like, they're getting, they're doing their PVs, but they're, they're going, oh my God, like I'm sure I don't know. Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden like, you get so straight into a squat and you're like, this is it. These are the things that are missing on programs. Yeah. And like, okay, you do 21, 15, nine, three sets of it, but actually that warm up was probably just more important to right. get you into the right place to keeping you, like Steve mentioned a long time ago, is like, I'll be good training wise if I just have a whole year like not injured mm -hmm. you're like yeah you don't yeah. have to be the best training every day but it's just like if you're not injured and you're not missing anything you're good mm -hmm. it's, it's true um, we had a few people yesterday off the back of what you said just saying what I actually feel so good off the, the <laughs> movement the movement work and I was like I can totally resonate with that and funnily enough uh, we watched a video of Catherine this morning, didn't we? Yeah. And she was uh, saying, oh, like, actually, if you, you spend more time when you warm, warm up and, you know, you're doing the, like, the snatch warm up that we put in the programme as an example, like, you're gaining so much opportunity and reps and I was just like, how has this person <laughs> managed to get to where she is without doing that? Imagine if she had done that from the start, she'd probably be, you know, pushing tear a lot more yeah. the past couple of years, potentially. So, it's a... Uh, yeah. Definitely an overlooked um, area. Um, I think taking those experiences, I think we've been, I've been very fortunate again with my exposure to, to the right people at the right time and my learning as a coach, as a, uh, a social athlete, I'm going to definitely put myself on. I'm going to train a bit harder. I heard, I heard Steve turns 35, I turn 35. I don't think we're in the same like, bracket <laughs> level, but I reckon we, we're both probably pretty close at necking a pint because I heard he's quite good at that. And, um, we'll give it a go. But just like the experiences of we've all part cross paths, like anyone that did cross it between 2014 and 2017 will have done an Eric weightlifting camp or have had at least five minutes with Eric. Um, and I think as much as like it wasn't for everybody, his principles and his attention to detail ring true with everyone that was at the top of their sport. He was like, he was 100% in on weightlifting. Some of the, the greatest memories I have of weightlifting, and I still do it today, is where Eric would roll in, pair of bands on, hoodie, like hat on, and then he'd just open his laptop. Mm -hmm. Let's watch 15 minutes of weightlifting, yeah. we'll watch weightlifting. And then we're watching Ilya snatch 192 from a hang with straps, and you're like, this is it, they're going to get me on a bar. And then his structure, um, like Catherine potentially didn't have, was like there. Like, and I think our JST weightlifting warm ups are born off of those structures. Yeah. The simple nature of it, they were hard. The attention to detail on the step in, I think we added like the, the burpee or did Eric do a burpee or yeah. a, no rep it as well? Definitely no rep it if you step. Yeah, there will be a burpee, I think, as yeah. well. Yeah. And I think those people go, oh, why on earth are you doing burpees? Like, well, I mean, you just don't want to do the burpees. Yeah. It makes you really pay attention to it and, yeah. and, and nail it on. But his experience was good. Um, what other experiences have I had like from coaching perspective? Did the mobility course very early on when Yami was on it okay. and got like a different perspective of like mobility. It was more like the Kelly's threat mobility one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Eric had a, a lasting impression on my attention to detail, mm -hmm. which was good. Oh, and also, how could I forget? Oh, Cameron Nicol. Yeah, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Another experience of an Olympic athlete at the top of their sport coming into CrossFit, coming to our gym, was a beast, but a lovely guy. Um, helped kind of take rowing from a rowing perspective and put it into a class perspective. Yes. And that was my role. Um, I'm the class guy. Like, how do I get this into a class? Uh -huh. And then got lucky to travel around and um, help deliver rowing. And again, his attention to detail was second to none. Um, I think most of you know who Cameron is.
there's, uh, there's loads of recurring themes that we've already spoke about in this conversation. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's shaped, it shapes how you become as a coach. So we spoke before about David and the attention to detail. Uh, we spoke before about, um, yeah, we spoke about quite a few different, mm. few different things that have just cropped up in the exact same, you know, yeah. in what you just said then. Um, and I think to, to go on from that as, as well now, um, where do you see or what would you like to, to do to kind of help the, the wider CrossFit community? Um, what do you think mm. is kind of the next step on your, on your journey there? I, um, think, uh, I think the first thing that I feel it should be utilised better and I think the regionals is, is starting to do that from a, the competitive perspective mm -hmm. but getting people together more frequently to share best practice yeah um, I think people can be very secluded or very closed-minded within their own stuff and I totally get like if you're a one man or one woman band owning a box you can't leave it like you've got to be there and you're doing the day to day yeah but if you get your get the opportunity to go and experience like new areas, like get to go to new boxes, go and meet new people, go on the affiliate gatherings, like get those nuggets of information, you're just going to improve your knowledge base. Um, so that's definitely something that we did. A, we've done a few coach development things. We did some mm -hmm. stuff for No Ball mm -hmm. um, down in London, just getting some London coaches together because so I think the functional fitness world, I call it, in in London, because again, there's like. 50% people are affiliated, 50% people say they're not doing CrossFit, but they're doing CrossFit. <laughs> um, but they're all, at the end of the day, in front of a group, delivering yeah. some kind of group-based class. And there's a lot more to be taken from the Barry's Boot Camps, um, who are great presenters. Yes. They yeah. are probably more 70% presenter, 30% mm -hmm. trainer. And then it's like, well, how can I take what was really good there, who kept me motivated, kept me coming back, who's probably like, oh, I can't be bothered to, no one wants to come in at 6 a.m. and like do overhead squats. But mm -hmm. if you've got someone who you know you can enjoy going to, it's like, how do I take that and then use that? Rather than going, um, someone always asked me, someone asked me at Summer Social when they have like an F45 pop up, what do you think of F45? So I love it. I'm like, what do you mean? You love it. They do shit exercises. I was like, <laughs> if my mum did F45, yeah. I'd be happy. They were like, why? I was like, because she don't do CrossFit. Yeah. She does nothing. Yeah. So if she does F45 mm -hmm. or any kind of exercise, it's better than nothing. Right. So we've got to be less about us and them mm -hmm. and more about everyone together. Yes. Um, and that doesn't matter where. Like I know people move from gym to gym. Mm -hmm. I moved down the road to another gym. And members move to other gyms and it's like it is what it is yeah like yeah, it is. rather than questioning oh, okay um, it must be them it's like is it us like, if you want if you want to keep someone like are you doing a good enough job to keep someone mm -hmm. um another way to think about it when i'm coaching a class if um if i explain something and someone someone doesn't get it it's not their fault like sometimes I know if they're not listening. Yes. But most of the time I'm like, okay, I'll try again. And then if they just don't get it, I'm like, I haven't explained it well enough. Yeah. Rather than going, oh, that person's a space cadet and they've got mm -hmm. no idea, they're not thinking, they're not listening, are they stupid? Actually, I just haven't done a good enough job of delivering it in a way that they can understand it. Yeah. So how do I do that next time? I, I remember you saying that a while ago and like that's always stuck with me as well. And then the other thing that we've, Put out to some of our gyms is the the different sorts of cues you can give to people and it's one of them can you go through each one of the different cues so um verbal uh tactile and visual visual thank you <laughs> <laughs> um and can you go all through them like hopefully after the three different styles that you have picked it up yeah. if if they haven't it's one of them like back to the drawing board how can you work better on the different cues to to improve and curiosity, that was the big thing. I think a lot of, and why you are so good is like, you're curious about stuff. Like I said about Barry's boot camps mm -hmm. then, it's like they get 50 to 70 people in a class. Mm -hmm. Like obviously they've got the kind of facilities and, 
and everything and all the runners to, to be able to do that but like you said they are obviously doing something right with how they present classes and deliver their classes is there something as a crossfit gym that we can do to that as well like is it I don't know, something more to do with the music. They're really good at kind of doing yeah. the music and the timing of it, do you know what I mean? It, it should be sparking ideas for yourself. Like, do you have warm-up music? Do you then have different music for different styles of workouts? You know, it, I think it's really exciting to get, get stuck into that and actually explore different things rather than being stuck in your own little box and just coming up with the same stuff all the time. And like I said about Greg before, like just interesting to see how different people coach is there any little nuggets you can take that, copy it, mimic it a little bit, put your own little flavour on it, and again, it brings you to where you are today as to you know where you are in your coach's development. The music thing is, is so, I don't think people realise it. So a couple of scenarios, um, we talked about yesterday in a second, but with music, um, when I go and open up a gym, or if I'm in and I'm coaching, try it obviously, you've got to be there early, you've got to be be ready, but like 50, at least 15 minutes before the class, I've got some music on, yeah. um, and it's low level, it's like some country music ticking over or something, something really chill and vibey, um, because when you don't, you don't, you, you, you really notice the silence, mm. um, and yesterday was a, a perfect example, there was music rolling in the background, they had it rolling, mm -hmm. and then it got to 10.30 and it was time to speak, and we didn't call anyone over straight away and just turn the music off. And then everyone stopped talking. And they were like, it's, I think it's time to go now. So you don't have to say anything. And you're like, the vibe's everything. If you go to a coffee shop, when now, next time you go to a coffee shop, there's music playing, you probably yeah. notice it. And the one time you, the music's not working, you will notice it and yeah. it'll be deafening. Um, so the coffee shop music kind of ticking over in the background is hugely important for making people feel comfortable and relaxed. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, changing the, changing the music is, if we think of the, the priority list of a CrossFit coach, it is down on the list, it's lower over. But once you feel like you've got the progressions, you've got your timeline and you've got the group moving, mm -hmm. like get the music right. Because um, I was talking to Sam Corforth um, the other day and he's like, I can never hear the music when I'm working out. Yeah. Apart from when I don't like music, mm. the music shit. <laughs> <laughs> it, stands, it stands out when it's not going. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, like those those kind of things from a coaching perspective are are there to like add to the experience. Mm -hmm. And nowadays with the premium that people pay with CrossFit, the volume of CrossFit gyms that go in, the level of detail that they're going into, this might become like a make or break for someone's job. Like. Yeah. Okay, you have two coaches that deliver excellence in all of their movements, but then you've got one group of members that like one of the members, the coaches' music. Well, yeah, yeah. Like, and you're like, okay, they go to that class because they enjoy that vibe. Yeah. And you're like, wow, could you? You might get to that point now. It's it's so true, and that's how that's how Paris works, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you most people and Hannah's got a few friends that go to Paris. And it's like I'm going to this class that this guy is taking because he how he speaks to the group and the music that he delivers as well is is on point whereas this other guy kind of shouts at you a bit too much it's a bit too military it's kind of you know not their vibe yeah. don't go to you know that other guy's class um, they get they get paid per member to yeah. go. so they get a base salary mm -hmm. and then they'll get paid a premium for how many come imagine if your crossfit coaches were then told you'll get a base salary which is probably a little bit low and you'll get paid per member that goes do you feel like their quality would improve? If it's a yes, you've got such an easy scope to get someone better as a coach straight away. If they're motivated like that, if they know that, okay, if they've got 20 people in the class, they're getting 40 quid now. Mm -hmm. Okay. If they've only got 10 people in the class, they're only getting 20 quid now. Mm -hmm. You're like, is that motivating? Like some people yeah. are motivated by money and, and it does make the world go round. But um, I know we flirted with that idea when there was a, a refurb at Blitz and there was a mm -hmm. conversation about it. It's, I don't know what the answer is in terms of how much you should, shouldn't, how much is dependent on that. But I certainly know that when we mentioned it to people, people's like standards improved yeah. because they were probably a bit nervous about these things mm -hmm. maybe kicking in and, yeah. and taking effect. Um, and I think that performance related pay is, is definitely something that from a coaching perspective, you can, we've all coached a shit class where we've just got through it. We've all coached an ace class and we're like, oh, that was worth way more than yeah. uh, another class. Yeah. Um, 
and again on on this staying on this uh, this subject as well if you can fight if you can find a group of coaches that just want to continually learn and pick up all those little things like you're on to a, a, you're onto a winner I think or I don't know obviously you're probably more in the loop here than me but is it hard to find CrossFit coaches that are like that or do you think there's more now or do you think we're still at the early stages where um, people aren't as into um, like the development as what they could be because they know that there's not the amount of CrossFit coaches around to, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think a long time ago at Blitz we had Tim, Ben, myself, uh, a guy called Simon, mm. who was a very good coach, um, Holly, who owns Tio, yeah. Deb Manlove, <laughs> who is an OG of the CrossFit world. We had probably the best group of coaches in London, like I'd probably say without a doubt. Yeah. We, Blitz was known for like the box, like the posh box because Ben kept it fucking tidy, <laughs> like you couldn't breathe in there. You could use chalk, but you just had to tie it up. Um, <laughs> But then like the attention to detail on the coach, it was driven by all of us. Mm -hmm. Like I would say that I was at the front kind of trying to pull it all together and create yeah. structure, but I didn't need to motivate people to be better coaches. They were doing it themselves. Cool. Like That's cool. that was good. And I see that now like at TO, um, our coaching group is a lot of experts, like Holly, Debs, myself, um, a girl called Anna, who's an amazing coach. Um, a guy called Grant, who absolutely loves his weightlifting, mm. old Codger Wardlow, like yeah. all of those people are all in and they're all self-motivated, they want to make people better. Um, and I know, I haven't actually experienced it, but Motion just down the road, who obviously a you know, competitive gym as well, they go yeah. to the games, CrossFit Surbiton, just knowing Dudley Harrison and Grace, I think they've created something there that I just see excellence coming out of it. Like not only in like their elite level performance, I'm like, I know their community's there. Yeah. I know they've got excellent coaches because if someone's moving out of the area and they're in, within now, I'm like, get over to Motion mm -hmm. because they just seem to know what they're on about and they've got this community and the coaches want to work for them. Yeah. Um, because you, if you get a group of coaches or if you get a coach now that's like going to the highest bidder, their loyalty's not there, they won't develop as a group, mm -hmm. they're not willing to work with, with other people. And some people are like that, um, I think. If I'm when I'm looking to employ a coach or bring a coach on, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily look at the skills that they have, yeah. I look at the personality that they have. Mm -hmm. um, and I use Har Young Harrison as an example, um, who's a traitor, um, who's not <laughs> Jess in a minute, but I reckon he'll be back in after this one. Day. Um, he's just got a great personality, um, he's just a nice guy, and he's willing to help people, he's got a smile, and all of those kind of things. And I'm like, I can teach him how to see a snatch. But I can't teach someone to hold a door open for someone. Mm -hmm. I remember like, he doesn't know that I'm saying this and I noticed it, but we were sitting in Blitz once and someone was coming up to the door and he just got up and opened the door. He's, he wasn't a coach. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. I speak. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know if he, he was aware. If he was aware and he was trying to impress me, well done. Like, well, <laughs> he's, like, he's not stupid, but like, he kind of just, he does the right things at the right time. and. I can't remember the name name for that, but like when you do the do the things where no one else is noticing, mm -hmm. like he's just doing it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. He's not doing it to really impress anyone. So yeah, that's uh, selecting a coach is based off of that. I think we and we've we've uh, spoken about this before. Where if you were to choose a coach that has all the knowledge in the world, but um, you know isn't a, like either a kind person or. Um, has much about them, you know, kind of personable or someone that's, you know, can talk to people, um, you know, empathise with them uh, and them not know very much at all. You take the person that's, you know, can empathise, is personable, um, you know, a kind person um, because you can always teach them. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can't teach someone to be a nice person, um, but you, yeah, you can definitely give them the, those other skills. Um, and it just, it means that they're not only going to be easier to integrate into your coaching team, mm. they're going to be like good with the members. Yeah. Like, they're going to be there, they're going to turn up to social events, they're going to do the right thing at the right time, as opposed to the person who's like the clock watcher or, or the person that's like so obsessed with the, 
okay, this needs to be 83.5% of, of 42, like, no, I don't give a shit about that. And like, do they need it? Like, does that member who comes three times a week that's, I was talking to one of my individual clients this morning, she like did a competition yesterday, and um, she was like, my, like she has some sandbag holes and stuff, and yeah. she was hanging there, and she's like, my back's aching, and this morning, like, my daughter asked me to pick her up, and I was like, ouch. And I was like, but she's great, like, she'll, mm. she'll pick, her daughter up like she's not gonna not yeah like she's yeah. the kind of person that like yeah. will get stuck in but she's at least she's aware mm -hmm. as opposed to that person like that's probably a bit too phoninic and they're like no 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 no, no. I, can't, I, I competed yesterday like yeah. i can't pick up my door I'm like, yeah. you're gonna pick up yeah. the door yeah. and she does so <laughs> um is there anything else that you feel like um a lot of either gyms or coaches are kind of missing out on or could look to maybe just get a few easy wins or easily improve or I don't know. Um, yeah, I think the, the one the one major thing that I always go back to and I think I've delivered it quite a few times is having a structure to do it to deliver a class. Mm -hmm. Once you have that, um, it doesn't necessarily need to be a, a written timeline, but you just need to know. I'm going to talk at the whiteboard mm -hmm. about the workout. I'm going to give yeah. some information. I'm going to get them into like a warm up. I'm going to talk to them about certain stuff. Then I'm going to go through the skill that maybe is required or the workout movements. And then I'm going to get them into workout. I'm going to finish. And then um, Ben introduced, which he took from the games when we finish our classes, to do three claps on three to signify the end of the class. Yeah. Uh, I think it was Chuck Carswell who used yeah, to signify the end of a yeah. end of a briefing yeah. with like one big clap or three yeah. claps. And it was like everyone meant new to leave. Yeah. Um, and it, it is something that it doesn't feel like a lot and then when you first do it it feels super awkward yeah. I remember, I remember Simon, Simon just wasn't doing it he was like nah I'm not doing it and I was like mate you need to start doing it because yeah. Ben catches you not doing it yeah, if you can cut the balls off yeah. um, and then yeah he did then, then it now members wait members wait until you do the three claps if you don't do the three claps they're like I can't go <laughs> I can't go um, so yeah having a structure to um to be able to just keep yourself in line because then it breeds consistency for your members. So say you have, we had seven coaches, we would all deliver a whiteboard yeah. in their own unique way. Mm -hmm. We'd deliver the warm up, which would probably be structured and then, and then through and then we'd finish the same. So the start and the finish would always be the same. Yeah. So then the members come to expect it. And then if they already know what to expect, we used to, I'm a big advocate of sending your members to other CrossFit gyms. If you're, if you ever want to know whether you're confident in your product, yes, you've told members to go to other gyms. If you're like, no, stay, don't go to another CrossFit gym. Yeah, um, and then you used to, especially, I think it has evolved. But I know when the members like years ago at Blitz you used to go to America or on holiday or something like that. They're like, so I kind of got in the gym, and they just said, well, look, here's the workout. We'll start in fifteen minutes. Get ready. And I didn't know what to do. I was a bit lost, and I was like. Okay, we're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. Could we do a better job? Though? Yeah. Because the better job I took from that was like our members don't know what to do if we're not there. Yes. I was like, oh, shit. We need to give them a little bit yeah. of like help and structure, but ultimately we need to then empower them to mm -hmm. do it. And I did it in a couple of different ways. Probably the best way I did it is when a member asks, "What weight should I do?" I'll be like, "What weight do you think you should do?" Mm -hmm. And they're like, I think 35 might be a bit too much, but I'd like to try and get stronger, so I might try and do that. And I'm like, you're telling me all the right things. Yeah. Give 35 a go. Mm -hmm. They've made the decision. So like from a point of view, if it was too heavy or too light, it's their fault. <laughs> <laughs> but then secondly, they've made the decision. Yeah. As opposed to, we've all been there as a coach, they're like, they're walking towards you like, 35, go and do 35. Mm -hmm. That'll be the right weight for you today. Mm -hmm. And then they don't have any like emotional relationship with that decision. You've yeah. like, just been told what to do. Mm -hmm. um, but you're there to like educate and inspire people so then they've got a better idea on what they should be doing. Because then in time, they tell you what they're going to do. Yes. And there's like three stages of it. There's like, what should I do? You ask them. Then the next stage of... They're like, I'm going to do 30 today. I think that's the right way, but they're telling you. Mm -hmm. And then the next stage is they don't even tell you, they just do it. And you're like, here you go. Yeah. And then you go over and then encourage, motivate, coach them to threshold uh, and those kind of things. Because yeah, when you get good athletes in your class, like Ben used to go in the class, um, if you're 
a new CrossFit coach, it might be quite daunting coaching a games athlete, mm-hmm. but because he moves really well, I learned to then not coach him on his movement because he didn't need those tweaks as much. Yeah. But what I did need to coach him on was his threshold. Mm-hmm. It was like, can you stay closer to the bar? Mm-hmm. Can you transition a bit faster? Because he was very, he's, if we all know Ben, he's very much in control, mm-hmm. but actually we needed to get him just outside of that control so yes. then he could push and threshold. Yeah. And a games athlete in Pat, who was a master, um, same kind of thing. He needed probably a bit more tweaks, but you've got to be willing to coach him. And I used to put new coaches in the classes that allowed, like that Ben was in, and yeah. Ben would go in those classes. Yeah. And I'd be like, Ben, did he coach or she coach you? And they were like, no. And then I'd be like, why didn't you coach Ben? Yeah. Like, oh, but he was doing it right. I was like, yeah, but imagine he was paying 200 quid a month, he won't get coached. Yeah. They're like, oh yeah. I was like, give him something. Yes. It might be a well done. Mm-hmm. It might be a good job, keep going, push it, push it, push it. You can be faster. Yeah. Like, keep going, hang on. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the kind of conversations to have with really, really good people. Yeah, they are. Yeah. We, we briefly touched on that last last bit about coaching. You know, if you're uh, not too confident in what uh, advice you should be, get, be giving, you know, a good athlete in your gym who may like move better than you, sometimes it's good to ask them like, is there anything you feel like you struggle with in this workout or when you do this lifting? You know, ask them their opinion because they probably will know or have an idea of what it is that they need to improve on and they'll really appreciate that you're actually trying to help them and like you said they're paying the 200 pounds a month just like you know john who's just started yeah. um so equally you know you should be giving them points to, to work on the other thing as well that you were talking about is the guided discovery and that's when you uh kind of point the members roughly in the right direction or ask their opinion and guide them to the right answer or what you yeah. know is the right answer. And that's something JST as a whole is very big on. It's like, we provide you with everything you need. So you are the kings and queens of, of your choices. And you know, as an athlete, you've just got to take the personal responsibility and have the curiosity to find out, oh, like, I'm going to try doing this, or like, I'm going to go out of my way to ask Jamie um, for some advice, Um, you know, so that's a huge... Verbalising it, I think, is a really important thing as well. I think we, when we spoke with Matt Rodwell, Mm. that we didn't record, (laughs) um, was, um, he is a big advocate at ARC about verbalising only the positive. Even if someone's going, oh, this is going to be really hard today or I can't do this today, he's not He's not a fan of that mm-hmm. um, because that can breed, like, not necessarily negativity, but doubt and yes. then insecurity and all of those kind of negative connotations that you can have in your head. But actually, you just want to have that positive, like, I'm going to give it a go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially with the high skill movements when you're coaching, definitely get every now and again when you go through um, a bar muscle up progression, it gets to the point where it's like time to attempt. Mm. And then you go, right guys, who's gonna give this a go? Yeah. And that one person goes, oh, I'll give it a go, but I don't think I'll get it. Yeah. I'm like, I don't think you'll get it then. That's you what I'm saying. Yourself, you and they're like, yeah. what? I was like, well, if you don't think you can get it, mm-hmm. no one's gonna believe you can it's get true. it. It's true. Give it a go. Yeah. Like, there's, no, there's no harm in failure mm-hmm. here, and you've gotta go in to it with your positive pants, you go to a good bit of a whack, and then when they get it, oh, I could do it, I'm yes. like, give it a go. Yeah. Um, obviously, that's where you guide them the other way. If someone's probably putting on weights or trying movements that are like far beyond their capabilities, but again, I'd never, I used to stop people doing that, but now mm-hmm. it's it's a, it's a learning experience. It is. It's learning to to fail and then and then motivate. And we when we were having a drink last night, talking about like how my daughter like teaching her how to lose. And learning how to fail as a as a concept that's quite a hard concept to to get behind because you you I've definitely had the point where my daughter's cried because I absolutely destroyed her in a workout or something like that yeah or like made her do something and she couldn't physically do it mm-hmm. but again on the back end of that that's a lesson learned if it's delivered correctly like you give them the win eventually but again if you always let someone win they're never going to know how to deal with when it's difficult. Yes. And I think, like, kids are resilient. Like, my relationship's now not a relationship. My daughter lives two hours away from me. And like, I was FaceTiming just before yeah. before here. 
and it, it's learning and like at seven years old like it she's she's just taking it in her stride kids are really resilient and they're they're just trying to get get their head around what's actually going on yeah so it's okay throw those things at them in a controlled environment mm -hmm. like her mother's really good with her can identify those kind of things that's why the facetime come up because she was yeah. missing me a bit and it's yeah. like had that interaction she'll feel great just check up on it later and it's like they're the things that like okay all of a sudden coaching is a bit irrelevant when you're and you've got a daughter and you're like, oh, right. she's crying on the phone because she wants to speak to you. And you're like, okay, well, let's, yeah. let's get it, let's get it back in line. Yeah. So. It's, uh, I think it's, it's, they tend to be much more powerful experiences when you are finding it out yourself rather than someone telling you. So for example, uh, like, like you said, I'll give the class situation where there's a guy that wants to put on this weight on the bar and you told him, no, you can't do it. He just feels like, oh, right, Jim is kind of holding me back. Whereas if you're like, yeah, go on, give it, yeah. give it, give it a go, see, see how it goes. And they don't finish the workout in the time cap. It's kind of like, I definitely shouldn't have gotten that workout. Um, and like you say, with, with children and stuff as well, I think we, you know, don't give them enough, um, I don't think that's the right phrase, but give them enough slack or give them enough credit. That's, yeah. the, that's the one. Because like you said, they are really resilient mm -hmm. and with all the experience that we have now and what we've learned as coaches and working with people, we know from like all those mistakes that you made, like when you were PT and early, that yeah. those are probably your best lessons and have helped you to become, you know, the great yeah. coach that you, that you are now. So you want to give your daughter and the best, uh, yeah. you know, best opportunity to those life experiences yeah. 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 Make, make everything. I think, um, also, yeah, being aware, I think, um, one coach Anna does a, an amazingly good job of in her cool down, she'll ask a good question. She's like, How did the workout go? Yeah, and that's like a good start point. And people go, oh, Yeah, it's hard, that was difficult. Oh, I was gonna be sick, and then she follows it up with an even better question mm. What could you do differently next time? Yeah. Not to go faster. Mm -hmm. Like she says, what can you do differently next time? And some people will go, oh, if I didn't rest as much, I'll go quicker. Some people are like, oh, I need to work on X movement. Yeah. And you're like, they're saying it. Yeah. Um, sometimes you have to like poke the bear. Like if you know someone's do not doing a good job, but that they're just two really good questions that bring the group together before mm -hmm. the three claps that are so empowering because then the person's already thinking about next time Mm -hmm. I come in, yeah. I'm going to work on that. And if you think they're already thinking about next time as a retention tool, yeah, God, it couldn't be that it's the best retention tool ever, but it's they're coming back. Yeah, it's true. Um, so I've got a, an individual client called Georgia. Uh, I think I'm saying this right, Eris. She's South African. Um, she's great, great girl. Uh, and before she went individual with me, she was used to more of like a hand-holding approach, like taking her through a training, tell her exactly how like to do stuff, how this workout should feel. And uh, I think the first month or so she uh, was kind of adjusting because I wanted her to be more curious about her training and what she wanted to get out of the training. And rather than, than me telling her exactly how I wanted to do stuff, I want her to decide herself and want to be like, what is it you feel like you need to work on? Like, do you want to try and do it this way? Maybe you do one set like that, you do one set like this, but you decide because you know yourself pretty much like how, you know, what you're gonna get the most out of there. Um, so I think that's how Steve and myself learned the best when we were training. Um, and I think also as well is, even though I'm individually programming for a client, I don't, I don't know for sure exactly how you're going to feel each day. Mm -hmm. And again, for you to get the most out of each training day, you need to do the best you can with how you feel. And some days you might not be feeling great. And what I've said, how I've said to do this workout mm -hmm. isn't the optimal way for you to do it that day. So I think giving athletes and people in classes that a little bit of flexibility but like say that having that guided discovery 
is how I feel is the most optimal way, making them the kings and queens of like, yeah. you know. Their... We, we had that conversation yesterday, didn't we? It was one of the questions. It yeah, was like, is. how do we, how do you balance training? It was more of a, a female um, cycle based question, yes. but it was still relevant for everybody in the group in terms of one person after we had like a little nutrition thing, it was like, it's reassuring to know that you guys are like normal. I mm. think she was referring to you <laughs> in terms of like your nutritional habits, but it was more like, okay, it's all right to not be eating chicken, broccoli and rice, like yes. no sauce and stuff as we were banging sriracha on those eggs <laughs> an hour ago. Um, yeah, just having, understanding there's that balance there. Mm. And I think that, being happy and relaxed is a much better training environment than just being pent up and trying to push to that next level. Yes. I think the, there's only it's a very, very small group of people that can do that dungeon -y kind of thing. And it's not necessarily CrossFit as a sport that can be done mm. that way. I think it's, it is an individual sport based thing, but it's a very closed environment. I think tennis is one of those, those sports um, where you just lock yourself away with your coach, you yeah. do it and then you go and play yeah. and you're there. Um, whereas I think CrossFit's far more than that because it could be that if there wasn't such a good community within CrossFit. Yes. If it was, like tennis probably has a great community, I don't know a huge amount about it, but I would I draw the conclusions on you could be quite an uh, introvert, keep, keep yourself on your own and then mm. go and be amazingly good at tennis. Yeah. Thinking in CrossFit, because you're doing the exercise in a CrossFit gym, mm -hmm. you have to have that element of, of like community yeah. and then the people that got right to the top like Matt Fraser went I can't do this in a CrossFit gym yeah I need it in my own gym mm -hmm. so then he brought himself away from that community environment and focused it on a sport same kind of thing I know we have those conversations with David and Emma um kind of training in a regular gym and mm -hmm. I know his training would be more optimal if he had his own thing and then if you see his house what he's got kind of rigged up yeah, there it's like yeah. his living room is a Miko triangle mm -hmm. I fucking love that. <laughs> like it wouldn't it wouldn't do anything for me, but like it'd just be a TV. But like his living room like is a game station, there's like a GHD in there and stuff like that. So yeah, I think it's it's definitely a matter of learning to relax and, and take things in your own stride and, and, and get in there whenever it gets there. Mm -hmm. Like you, there's no need for it to be rushed. Mm -hmm. Um I think that everything takes time and, and you get to those, those things. I think something that a lot of people really struggle with is um, like if someone's improving faster than them and they're like, why am I not improving the same way, you know, that, that they are? And it's, there's a, a multitude of reasons, like they might be sleeping, you know, nine hours a night, whereas you can only get six hours a night because you're having to wake up with your kids and, you know, just how they're built genetically is a little bit different. and. You know, there's so many factors that go into that and it's never helpful asking that question yeah. because you can't control that. What you should be focusing on is, am I doing everything that I can right now to, you know, make sure that I'm making the best improvements that I can? If you are, great. If you're not, like, can you do something about it? If not, again, don't worry about it. That comes down to goal setting and that comes down to goal setting correctly. And the, the incorrect way to do it is, um, I want to qualify for semi-final. Mm -hmm. Okay. How can you control that? Mm. Because if you want to qualify for semi-final, you can't control everybody else's performance. Yeah. And I think I learned this, not from my own experiences, of watching Ben. So Ben qualified uh, for that region, was 2014, yeah. come 11th. Yeah. Cool. I just got to do a bit more training and I'll come in the top five and go to the games. All right. Fast forward to the next year, I think he got injured or like got, got sick. Um, he probably could control that, but the focus for him was to try and improve. Yeah. But the, the field from a CrossFit perspective moves forward 10% every year. Cool. So if he needed to improve by 10% and then those people ahead of him already improved by 10%, that's 20%. Mm -hmm. Like all of a sudden, are you going to improve 20% in a year when you start to then actually think about, can you put 20% on your snatch in a year? Yeah. Can you put 20% on your like seven minutes of earthies? Mm -hmm. Like all of a sudden, you're like, actually, I need to think about this intrinsically and then look at what it takes. And, and with JSC Athlete, we created like the little matrix of what does it take to be a court final athlete, mm -hmm. like the average numbers, what it, does it take to be a semi-final athlete, mm -hmm. what does it take to be a games athlete? 
they're the metrics that you try and shoot for. Yeah. Because you're in control of those. Yeah. The person next to you might snatch more than you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's irrelevant. Yeah. If you hit those numbers, you've got to come away and go, the leaderboard is the leaderboard. If I executed to the best of my ability, and I hit the numbers that I set out to do, I hit the goals that I set out to do, I've got to be happy with my performance. Then yeah. you get that reward, even though the reward isn't going to the competition. Mm -hmm. Because if, yeah, would you would you be satisfied in qualifying for the semi final that you did a shit job, and then everyone else just did a shitter job? Yeah, like I don't think people would be as satisfied. Like there'd be the odd person there that would like to put that in their Instagram bio that I did semi finals, but actually like we can all smell that bullshit. Like we actually see the people that work hard and that get there, and then you're like, they've worked hard for that. They're they're not posting their massive lifts on Instagram, they're just getting on with it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like in terms of goal setting, going back to what I originally started with, it's like, don't have a competition in mind, have it there as a, like a carrot angle, so when your training is fucking really hard, that's what gets you through the end of your session, but ultimately the goal is to like complete the individual tasks as best as you can. Yeah. You said the people that get better quicker than the other people are doing the important things better. Mm -hmm. They are, getting that sleep, they are sacrificing night outs, mm -hmm. they're, they're doing all those little things that are going to add up to big things in the future, they're doing their movement mechanics, they're stretching, they're st all of that, but mm -hmm. they're just doing it better than the other person. Taking Ben as a, as a bit of an example from what you said then, and I don't know the exact uh, situation of like what his training was like or anything like that, but obviously what he was working and got into to regionals that, that first year, and he was like, right, I need to train more, which is automatically what a lot of athletes think that they need to do to get to that next level. And probably for the, for the most point, isn't isn't always a case for a lot of people because was the reason that Ben got injured and maybe was ill a bit more that next year, was it because he was training that little bit more? Mm. Like, I don't know. I'm not saying that it was, um, but it, it could have been. Mm. It Maybe it... It's, and it's usually better to think, right, is everything outside of training on point first? Is my warm up optimal? Like, I'm doing that movement mechanics before I'm going into the session. Mm -hmm. That's going to make me move better. I'm moving better. I'm going to be moving more efficiently. I'm going to be less fatigued in workouts. I can do more reps as well um, because I'm moving better. So, it's, yeah, more isn't always better and don't always resort to that because. For a lot of people, it's the easy answer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely. Better is better, and training with better people. Like better. <laughs> that's yeah, totally. Like, it is. firstly, it's a humbling experience. It, it makes is. you it makes you very aware of like getting your ass kicked. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's something to be be associated with. I think we um, we spoke with Reggie about this. Like, there was a period where obviously Reggie was absolutely fucking smashing everyone. Yeah. At fitness. Yeah. And then you turn up to like a semi final, mm -hmm. and then you're the person behind mm -hmm. and it's like well how do you deal with that if you yeah. if you never if you never experience people in front of you we I, I genuinely i reckon we had workouts with ben where we used to start ahead of him mm. in training sessions one was a funny story was by not funny for us but there was a workout and in the like 10 second countdown like if you guys know ben he was like oh, i need two seconds i need to go to the loo and he went <laughs> he went around the ship he was like start without me like five minutes go past and we're in this workout and then he comes out and then beats us by five minutes. So he actually beat us by 10 minutes in the workout. But I think it was probably good motivation for him because yeah. he probably saw where we were and was like, I'm going to keep going here, yeah. keep going. And then he beat us and sat down and I was just like, it was cool because I, don't, I'm, I wasn't going home and being really stressed about it. I am, mm -hmm. fucking hate losing, don't get me wrong. I yeah. absolutely hate it, but I'm again aware of my like ability level and the balance in my life that I have. That I was like, well, he's that I think it was in it was just before he moved up right, okay. um, to you guys because yeah. he searched out two times the the harder challenges. So he met Matt um, Matt Rodwell mm -hmm. and Rob Manlove in London mm -hmm. around 2014, 2016, does does all his training, kind of 50-50 winning and losing, and then did went up and was like the opportunity to go go there and I remember when like when he first went up he, he doubted his ability yeah and I think that was probably a good thing mm -hmm. I think like probably in the moment he probably hated that because no one wants to be feeling like they're not good enough or yeah. insufficient when yeah. he was getting like spanked by members in 17.1 
but then like obviously you guys gave him the trust and gave him the opportunity and then obviously clearly even fucking good 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 <laughs> fitness, <wasn't he? laughs> um so yeah like going and searching out people that are better than you and going and get your ass kicked is probably a more valuable experience than winning the whiteboard at your gym yeah and i in my opinion right now we were doing the people at that semi-finals regionals level were doing it a lot more a couple of years ago mm. than what they are now um don't know what the reason for for that is really um but I'd like to think we're trying to help to break down those barriers at regional events. Yeah. I know probably most of the athletes there are on you know, semi-finals level, but it would be amazing to get more semi-finals level athletes to those events or you know, in similar uh, like either training camp situations where they do actually get together a, a little bit more and mm. you know, raise the bar, raise the level. Um, like we've got athletes coming to Wigan on a, on a regular basis, like next week, as an example. We've got Jemmy Orr coming down, Fraser Clark coming down, we've got a young girl, Connie, coming up. Obviously, Ed Cook's kind of moved to Wigan, and Phil Ray's uh, in around Wigan. And it's just, like you said, the big thing as well is environment. Um, and to be honest, environment is possibly, or arguably, the biggest thing as well, because if you're in the right environment, then it's going to drag you in that direction. You're going to help, you know, build and sustain that momentum in that environment as well. Because I know for myself, when we had the team together in 2017, I think that was a, probably the fittest and the strongest that I have ever been. And I just thrived at being in that environment because it was like, Right, I'm not just doing this for myself, I'm doing it for all these other guys. I liked doing it in a group as well. It would just kind of, yeah, was good. And maybe that's why I wasn't as good when, you know, I went individually. You know, I kind of missed out on, on going to the games individually. Um, and I felt like after that year when we went team in 2017 and Steve wasn't kind of training as much, obviously everyone moved away. Um, like I found it pretty pretty hard after then. Mm. It, the kind of the focus switched from like it being about the team and, and getting better to be like I have to get to the games next year, mm. and that focus completely switched. And by the time we got to strength in depth, and I spoke about this before, um, I was just felt really burnt out, and I knew I'd not given anywhere near my best. Um, so environment can. Yeah. Can really do some bits that environment like and it can manifest in lots of different ways i kind of would if i think back to rugby the two the two major environments that were well, the two big head coaches that were in, the, in for the first team first one's a guy called tony ray aussie guy um his nephews uh, rowan smith is his nephew i'm pretty sure now um who's the was the lead coach or is the lead coach mm -hmm. and um he was a very relaxed aussie guy mm -hmm. like Perf absolutely perfect for like a 16 to 18 year old kid. The environment was like, go and try it. Like I was a goal kicker yeah. and um, used to go turn up to training early and they'd be like, go and grab a bag of balls, go and, go and bang a load of kicks. Oh, yeah, I love that. Like, all day, yeah. like, the encouragement was there. And then that kind of paved the inquisitive nature of it. And then he moved on and then we had Brian McDermott. So Brian McDermott was the total opposite yeah. right. of Tony Ray. Ex, ex army, marine, yeah. like, fighter, boxer, um, very like ex-Leeds legend, um, mm -hmm. come down and was like, he's full on. Mm -hmm. And he pulled everything in line and he was like, fuck, there was no bullshit there. Yeah. There was no like minute late for the meeting if, you, if you're not 10 minutes early, you're, you're five minutes late kind of thing. Yeah. And it was like, it took a, a proper adjustment. Certainly the, the Aussies and the Kiwis just really struggled. Yeah. Uh, they just, they couldn't get their head behind like how militant it was. Yeah. Because that was his background, but then it it shaped and it paved a different way of doing it, and it got similar results. Mm -hmm. So those those environments, like it, it's about how you cultivate it and, and how you you integrate yourself into it. But yeah. ultimately, the end goal is the same. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that that segues nicely into 
a little bit more about the coaching side of things again coming back to that because you want to as a coach you want to try stuff and even if it doesn't go right you want the support of you know either the gym owner or the other coaches to be like look that was fine it, we know it didn't work like you're not being you know scolded or anything like that um you want to be picked up and it's like right we know that didn't work next time let's let's maybe not do that or mm. try something else but also it's good to have that bit of discipline in the other sense where it's like it's good to have a bit of structure sometimes and that organization that military kind of approach it's a balance of the both is probably yeah it's knowing how far to take it that, yes. that's the one thing i learned from the two is like try the try the idea and then it's like don't keep knocking on the door if it's going to like get diminished in return just like look, look to cut it short and just like leave it mm -hmm. like okay that just didn't work like if we think back to the the blitz two-person coach thing from a business perspective it just didn't make sense because you're paying two coaches the same amount of money you get one coach who was leading it and the other person was demoing it had like some positives in terms of group management but then it was like actually what are members getting out of this mm -hmm. like the, it's like okay we tried it we tried it tried it. actually we need to change it we need to and yeah. it was a uh, members and like you're not gonna happy make every member happy when you're doing that they're like oh, i love that big group environment like yeah cool but from a logistics point of view it just wasn't yeah, yeah. like if you just couldn't have two coaches all the time because you want to go on holiday like, you needed twice yeah. as many coaches yeah, yeah. and then yeah. you just couldn't do it yeah um so yeah like learning learning when to curb it and then learning when to like push it on is a again a skill in itself and you don't get it right and you shouldn't like aim to try and get it right mm -hmm. you should just aim to do it mm -hmm. and give it a crack and then if it works it works like the regionals thing is is like how it was born was like and now how it is now is like it's still very similar but it's evolved massively yeah. Yeah. and it's much more we realize now it, it's so much about just participation mm -hmm. it's about trying to get people potentially on other programs or like just people doing crossfit understanding like it is not about signing up to the program like mm -hmm. i always say that at the start I'm like guys you're not getting a code at the end of this for jsc yeah. <laughs> like you're not like we're helping facilitate an event for people to practice mm -hmm. fitness racing yes like and they're like oh okay like we had tom who comes from cm2 one of their coaches he was on the red pill thing, like mm -hmm. educate himself well, become a, a, a serious athlete now, like yep. put himself pretty good. And he's on red pill and he did it and he's like, I absolutely love that. Like right. I'm gonna be coming around and searching out like those because it's only gonna create his level and his baseline higher. Mm -hmm. Like he's probably at CM2, which I'd say are fairly competitive, but that's because Rob is very competitive. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he's probably absolutely destroying everybody. Yeah. Whereas that day he was getting pushed along yes. and people were like challenging him and he's mm. like oh maybe maybe i need to search out those opportunities a bit more yeah. um to try and get get yourself there because that's that's why i love regionals it's so much fun downside is though it's got a lot of winners it? <laughs> yeah. maybe if we combine all the uk scores <laughs> well, oh, sorry uk england <laughs> yeah. scores england versus the world because I guarantee they all they want to see is like Scotland and Wales above us. That's <laughs> all that they were going to see. Um, well, we've been speaking for over two hours there. I know. Um, covered a load of good stuff. Just to kind of leave this conversation for you, like within our kind of community and maybe more as a coach, what are the your three kind of really important values to you that you think are like important for the people around you to to kind of take on board and, and be the first thing the first thing is to be honest yeah not only with yourself but with others mm -hmm. um honest with yourself with is your performance good enough in whatever you do that's not exercise based that's like was is your are you performing as well as you can because it doesn't matter what other people think if you're giving me your best shot well done yeah it doesn't matter like performance sometimes is is not good enough like yeah. If I gave my best shot at rugby, that's probably what I regret a little bit. I'd probably do a bit more fitness mm -hmm. and then I'd probably be able to say if I wasn't good enough, I wasn't good enough. Yeah. Um, another thing would be be prepared. Okay. Be prepared, not necessarily like prepared for every situation, mm -hmm. but be prepared to deal with situations, yeah. i.e. something shit's going down, like are you prepared? to make a decision based off of that mm -hmm. um, because again 
it isn't linear, is it? Everything's all over the place. So yeah. I'm going home in a bit. And I really hope there's no hole in my <laughs> scene. But I can't dabble on that. Like, I've just got to be like, eh, okay, it is what it is. When I get there, I'll deal with it. I'm pretty sure it's not, because I've learned very little. <laughs> um, and then the third thing, I think, go for it. Like, fuck me, far too often, like, what I don't want to do is, I've probably done it with the rugby things, like, what, what, what could have been? Yeah. I, I didn't go all in. I was quite good at rugby, but I didn't go all in. I could have like not gone out on the piss as much. Mm -hmm. um, could have like got more sleep, like that kind of stuff, but I didn't. And I don't have a regret for that too much. I'd be more like, right, if you're going to give this a crack, like that's why I went all in on CrossFit and yeah. the coaching side of yeah. it. So I was like, no, I know I can do it. So yeah, go for it. Yeah, amazing. That was, yeah, about two hours just flown by. So thank you very much for your time. And Thanks, Jack. I'll have to, uh, I'd probably do this again a little bit more often, maybe. Yeah, yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Um, maybe, maybe the talks about certain situations in CrossFit. I think there's definitely uh, between us. We know a lot about a lot. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah. nice actually, and this is why we do, you know, like the stuff that we are like trying to get in front of more gyms and people just to try and share that knowledge and hopefully mm. help help people because that's where we align pretty well is we want to help people and yeah. you know yeah. with this within like our crossfit we know it can do so many different things like get people healthy mentally you know help people create a great social space you know it's a great sport um, yeah and again people to understand that they don't know anything like that great analogy is like when you first start you know nothing yeah and then there's a period of time where you think you know everything yeah. and i've had that yeah i thought i know everything i'm nailing this and then it's like well if you come out the backside and then realize you know nothing yes you are going to be a person that people want yeah you're going to be there you're going to be like you're at their level mm -hmm. um, as opposed to thinking you're up there but actually people know that you're down there yeah thanks mate that was great thank you joe I haven't even a wee for like the past hour. Okay. Oh my god, my stomach is killing. They said they'll they said they'd be in about one o'clock anyway, so perfect timing. Don't forget this.